Christian Audio presents Poverty, Riches, and Wealth, Moving from a Life of Lack into True Kingdom Abundance, written and read by Chris Vallotton. Forward In Christian circles, the topic of poverty and wealth is often met with controversy. Many people wonder how their financial situation matters to God, if at all. Know this, God's dream for you is so much bigger than yours. He promises prosperity and good success. Why is this important? Because it does matter to God. He can take you beyond anything you have imagined, and He can take you places you have only dreamed about. I find most people are bound by a spirit of limitation. They believe they will never achieve anything. They believe they will never get past their poverty. They believe God blesses only certain people. The enemy wants nothing more than to keep God's people chained to the spirit of lack and limitation. God wants the opposite. The key to living a prosperous life, and this doesn't apply solely to finances, is to invest our resources and our time and our gifts into others. We are kingdom investors. We are blessed to bless others. After all, we can't bring anything with us in the end. A freeing teacher, my friend Chris, explores with wisdom and solid biblical foundation in this book how to gain perspective on kingdom wealth. We must be grounded in our identity in Christ. We must understand God's love for us. We must know the difference between riches and wealth. And believe me, there is a difference. I am so glad I worship the living God who wants me to prosper. He gave all things to us to enjoy in Christ. The difference between living in prosperity and living in poverty is a choice. Choices have consequences. God told Israel, He set life and death and blessing and cursing before them. They had to choose life or death. See Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. It is not by chance that you are blessed. It is by choice. It is God's will to give you prosperity with a purpose and to make you a blessing to others. We are not owners of anything. We are stewards of everything He has given us. I am confident Chris will inspire you through His words. Walk with Him through His story and learn how His outlook has been shaped over the years. You will be encouraged that God wants more for you than you may think He does. Jensen Franklin, Senior Pastor, Free Chapel, Gainesville, Georgia Introduction Attitudes of Nobility My father drowned when I was three years old, leaving my mother penniless and with two small children to feed. It was the late 1950s and our social welfare programs in America provided bare sustenance. We moved into the project surrounded by other people who were, for various reasons, stuck in the same system of poverty as we were. I soon learned that there was a kind of camaraderie among poor people, fueled by our strong feelings about common enemies. We all despised wealthy folks, railed against big businesses, and blamed Uncle Sam for our deprived condition, to name just a few of our targets. We were little, powerless people, lost in a sea of humanity, paddling hard, but getting nowhere. The winds of financial adversity pounded against our tiny boats, and as if that was not bad enough, wealthy cruise ships passed in haste, leaving us to contend with their wake. This further reminded us of the inconsiderate ways of the rich and cemented in our mind the stone wall of indifference that divided the haves from the have-nots of the world. I was saved at 18 years old and became part of an amazing church. We were princes in a royal family, or at least that's what I thought. But soon I discovered that God's noble people also despised wealth and actually had the same mentality as the people I grew up with in the projects. Despite the fact that we all yearn for a heavenly kingdom with gold streets and pearl gates, and that we knew our Heavenly Father was rich beyond comprehension, we still gravitated towards poverty like a tick on a dog's behind. We actually created doctrines to enshrine poverty as if it was the pinnacle of some spiritual enlightenment, the Mount Rushmore of Christianity. We made Jesus poor, forgetting that He was the architect of heaven and the creator of the earth. We viewed His disciples as homeless transients, wandering from village to village, spreading the news of sacrifice and piety, and eking out a mere existence from a few coins dropped in an offering by a widow or two. Paul's exhortation to his beloved Timothy was inscribed in the halls of our conscience like a thundering voice from God echoing from some holy mountain. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. It's not that we did not know that there were others, other scriptures that is, it's just that we whispered them in dark corners and secret dialogues with only our trusted friends. Then, every once in a while, it would happen. A close comrade would break ranks with the righteous and set sail into the treacherous waters of wealth or riches. We would watch as his or her soul was carried out to sea, a tiny boat disappearing on a distant horizon, never to return again. I got married two years after I was saved, and I carried my poverty prejudice with me into my marriage. Kathy and I worked hard and eventually owned nine businesses. Several of them were very successful, but I determined that we would never get lost in the sea of prosperity. We anchored our souls to the shore of sacrifice and stayed there for 22 long years. I also etched these values deep in the hearts of my four children, instilling in them the noble virtues of sacrifice and piety. I warned them of the dangers of wealth, recounting the stories of those who dared to hoist their anchors and lose sight of the safe shores of poverty and small thinking. We left the business world and moved out of the mountains to Redding, California, where Kathy and I became pastors at Bethel Church. A few months passed without any significant change in my heart, at least that I was aware of. Then suddenly, it all happened. My poverty spirit crashed on the shores of adversity, and my tiny boat of small thinking began to break apart, torn by wave after wave of revelation. The scriptures that used to be my safety net were now ripping under the weight of exponential increase. I scurried around in panic, trying desperately to mend my broken nets of poverty, but they simply would not carry the load of prosperity that was being charged to our account. We were becoming the very ones we had warned people about, and it scared the heck out of me. The others, other scriptures I mean, that we had uttered in secret with just a few friends were now being shouted in public podiums, in classrooms, and on social platforms. It was our coming out party, but we were not the ones throwing the party. God was. We were being financially blessed to the point that it was becoming ridiculous, even embarrassing at times. I really had two primary fears. First, I worried that we would be thought of like those guys who abused the faith message and seemed to measure their spirituality by the stuff they owned. I certainly never wanted to measure my spirituality, or anyone else's for that matter, by what they own. The truth be known, I never had enough to be tempted to do that. Second, I was concerned that people would think that we were mismanaging the money they donated to our ministries and were using it for our personal gain. We had lived very modestly our entire life, primarily because there was no other option. There simply had never been enough money to do much more than meet our basic needs. Then suddenly, thousands of dollars began to pour in from a number of different sources, from real estate deals to book sales and from teaching materials to conference offerings. Thousands of dollars found their way into our bank accounts. Soon we were giving away about half of our profits, and there was still enough left over to live in abundance. The whole thing came to a climax in May of 2016 when a man I had never met before insisted on paying off my house to the tune of $487,000. I'll recount that story for you in chapter 6. The payoff of our house was the final straw for me. I saw it as a confirming sign from God, and I was compelled to tell the world what the Lord was revealing to us about wealth. I felt like one of the four lepers who discovered a feast in the midst of a severe famine in the city of Samaria, in the middle of feasting at the banquet table left behind by the fleeing enemy, the lepers said to one another, We are not doing right. This is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. That's Second Kings chapter 7, verse 9. I knew I had to brave the criticism of those who would question my motives and or methods and write a book about true kingdom wealth. I think this revelation is a catalyst to overthrowing the principality called mammon, and establishing a wealth mentality rooted in heavenly wisdom. My primary motive in writing this book is to break the back of poverty and release a spirit of prosperity on the world. When I use the word prosperity, I don't mean the world's definition of riches. I mean true kingdom wealth. Here's a short synopsis of kingdom wealth. God's Definition of Wealth Number 1. Wealth is the ability, resources, strength, and wisdom to create positive outcomes in the midst of lack, poverty, or emptiness. Number two, wealth is light in darkness, healing in sickness, prosperity and poverty, 
wholeness in brokenness, favor in obscurity, love for the unlovely, beauty for ashes, and victors among victims. Number three, wealth is a can-do attitude, a more-than-enough mindset, and a nothing-is-impossible belief system. Number four, wealth is radical generosity, extraordinary compassion, sacrificial giving, and profound humility. Number five, wealth is always thankful, never jealous, and it does not brag, and it celebrates others, and it looks to the future. My prayer is that you would find keys in this manuscript that would unlock your legacy and release prosperity on your children's children. I hope that you will be so transformed by the revelation in this book that it will literally alter the course of your history. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. Part 1. The True Meaning of Kingdom Wealth In the first part of this book, we will discuss the true meaning of kingdom wealth as we contrast it with poverty and riches. I will prove that there is a power to make wealth and that there is a spirit behind poverty. I will also help you discover how to embrace the abundant life that Jesus promised and how to avoid becoming rich instead of wealthy. Chapter 1. The Net Worth of Jesus In July of 2016, I was invited to meet Pope Francis with a small group of pastors at the Vatican in Rome. I was rocked by the invitation. Not that I had anything I wanted to ask or say to the Pope, but come on, who doesn't want to sit down in a meeting with the Pope of the Catholic Church? I was excited and a little nervous. The day before I left, I lay awake most of the night envisioning what it was going to be like meeting the Pope. I wanted to make a good impression on him. After all, I was a Protestant pastor and he was a Catholic Pope. We were, by the nature of our religious affiliations, arch enemies for five centuries. I spent most of the next morning packing, but I could not decide what to wear. I tried all seven of my suits on, 15 dress shirts and 25 ties. I finally narrowed my selection down to two, but I could not make up my mind. Should I wear my three-piece gray pinstripe suit with my black silk shirt and black tie, or should I wear my two-piece black suit with my gray shirt and my red Garcia tie? I tried both of my suits on several times, changing the combination of shirt and tie and shoes, and I finally decided to bring them both and resolve the issue when I arrived at the Vatican. Of course, each suit required a different pair of shoes, so I polished all four shoes to make sure I was prepared. I was concerned that the suits would be wrinkled when I arrived at my destination, so I packed my portable steamer in my special fold-over suitcase. I also went out and bought two new pairs of socks one to match each of my suits. I was ready. The next morning, I got up at 3 a.m. and I put on my comfortable jeans and my Batman shirt and I began my two-day journey to the Vatican. I had four connecting flights and several long layovers before I would reach my final destination. Before I could board my fourth flight, the airline announced that the flight was canceled. What? Suddenly, 200 people rushed to the ticket counter to try to find an alternative flights to get to their destinations. United Airlines finally agreed to put me on another airline flight, a flight that arrived at the Vatican six hours later. Although I would not be getting much sleep before meeting with Pope Francis, at least I'd get there on time. I was a happy camper. When I finally arrived in Rome, I was completely exhausted. I dragged my tired hiney down two escalators and arrived at the luggage carousel along with a couple hundred exhausted passengers. It was 10 p.m. in Rome, and I still had to catch a taxi to the Vatican. The luggage took forever to reach the carousel. Finally, the beautiful sound of the buzzer began to blare. Then another half hour passed, leaving three passengers without luggage. And yes, you guessed it, I was one of them. Unbelievable, I said out loud. I made my way back to the black hole room, the place where airline employees try to solve the mystery of your lost luggage. I heard rumors that these employees train by trying to find unmatched socks that emerged from dryers. Thirty more minutes passed, and it was time for my turn at the counter. A frazzled-looking woman in her late forties greeted me in Italian. Do you speak English? I inquired. No, she responded in a thick accent. Oh, great, I thought. She handed me a form to fill out which had some pictures of luggage at the bottom. The entire form was in Italian, so for the next 20 minutes, with sign language that was similar to hieroglyphics, she guided me through very broken English through the process of completing the form. 
I googled a picture of the Pope and told her that I was meeting with him at 1 p.m. the next day. I needed my clothes, I kept repeating. By noon, I begged. She gave me a phone number to call and told me to try calling in the morning. Unbelievable, I repeated out loud. Before I left home, I was concerned about what suit I should wear. Now I might have to be with the Pope in a crummy Batman shirt and ragged jeans. I mused, yikes. I arrived at my hotel at 12.30 a.m. and laid my head on the pillow at 1 in the morning. I was exhausted, but my mind insisted on playing movies of meeting with the Pope. I imagined myself in my old, ragged Batman shirt and tattered jeans in the midst of pastors dressed in three-piece suits and Pope Francis in his royal robes. What would the Pope think of my humble attire? I mused further. Maybe he would view my unpretentious situation and conclude that a homeless person had somehow slipped into the Vatican. The problem was that my then-present situation did not actually represent my true economic reality. The fact is, I'm not destitute. I own seven expensive suits. Furthermore, I am not homeless. I actually have a big, beautiful house nestled on three acres of oak trees in a gated community. Simply put, I may have looked poor and homeless, but Rome was not my home. Redding, California is. Measuring my affluence by observing my situation in Rome, therefore, would have led you to the wrong conclusion about my monetary condition. Earth is not my home. Jesus arrived in the flesh on this planet through a woman named Mary. Yet it is important to remember that Jesus did not originate in her womb. She was simply the vehicle that carried him to earth. She was the plane ride to his destination. His conception was otherworldly, or more accurately, heavenly. Interestingly, look at the phrase the Apostle Paul used to describe Jesus' earthly entry. Being found in the appearances of man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even to the death on the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Jesus found himself in the appearance as a man. Now that phrase is intriguing in numerous ways. First and foremost, it is essential that we understand that Jesus is not human. He is, in fact, God. I'm not sure how he found himself here. Could he possibly have agreed to not remember his true identity when he entered the Earth's atmosphere? Did he have to go through the same process of self-discovery as we do to discover his true identity as the Son of God? Some theologians believe that he did. But whatever the case, one thing is for certain, Earth was not his home. Much like the condition in Rome, with my Batman shirt and ragged jeans, if you make the mistake of judging Jesus' net worth by his humble earthly condition, you will misjudge his prosperity and undermine his mission. The Apostle Paul put it like this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 Wait, what did Paul just say? Jesus was rich, but then he became poor? The reason he became poor, so that we might become rich? That's incredible. Jesus' home is heaven. Now, I'm not sure where heaven is exactly, but the biblical description of it sounds pretty incredible. For instance, the heavenly Jerusalem has streets of pure gold, like transparent glass, with twelve pearl gates. Each of the gates is a single pearl, and the material of the wall is jasper. Moreover, the entire city is pure gold, like clear glass. Revelation chapter 21. Jesus left his earthly home and was born in a manger. It might be obvious, but a manger is a barn where the Israeli shepherds kept their donkeys, sheep, and camels. It would have smelled like manure, been infested with flies, and been filled with poop. When our Lord's earthly birth is contrasted to his heavenly home, the reality of Jesus' humble state emerges with startling clarity. I want to point out again that Jesus became poor for a reason. His celestial mission was to make us wealthy. It is the great exchange, beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, hope for hopelessness, healing for sickness, prosperity for poverty. You get the idea. Jesus called it abundant life. The Wickedness of Wealth I want us to stop for a moment while I make a few observations about heaven. First of all, if wealth and riches are inherently evil, what are they doing in heaven? Why would God describe heaven so lavishly if wealth were bad, or even bad for you? For example, can you imagine God describing heaven 
as a place filled with opium fields and heroin factories? No, because drugs speak to us of evil, bad, addictive, destructive substances that ruin people's lives. In other words, we all know that these substances in themselves are destructive, so we would never use them to describe a positive condition. On the other hand, wealth cannot be intrinsically evil, or the Bible would not describe heaven as a place of unimaginable riches. In fact, if heaven is God's goal for us, then wealth must be a piece of our prize. Our idea of poor Jesus is similarly skewed. Although Jesus left heaven, heaven never left Jesus, because the kingdom of prosperity always begins from the inside out. You can put Jesus in a manger, but you can't put a manger in Jesus. Wealth, glory, and power seeped out of his pores like sweat on a hardworking man on a hot, humid day. Here's a case in point. Jesus went to a wedding in a village called Canaan. Soon after he arrived, the party was in danger of ending prematurely because they didn't buy enough wine to sustain all the guests. Mary, his mother, convinced him to make more wine for the wedding. Jesus ordered the waiters to fill six stone water pots with water. The water was instantly turned to wine. See John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. There was no grapes necessary, which means the entire process of growing vines and picking grapes was bypassed. Furthermore, the long process of fermenting the wine, which takes years to complete, was also circumvented. When the head waiter tasted the wine, he was stunned because it was so good. It's important to remember that Mary is the one who insists that Jesus make wine. How did Mary know that Jesus could make wine from water? Could she have experienced Jesus making wine at home? My point is that if Jesus could have made wine from water in two minutes, then it stands the reason that he may have been living modestly on the outside, but wealth flowed from his innermost being. Mary and Joseph may have been a middle-class carpenter family, but they may have been drinking wine that reminded them of heaven at home. In fact, the wine was so good that the Bible says that when Jesus made wine, he manifest his glory. Now that's great wine. I guess he was not kidding when he said that he is the vine and we are the branches. See John 15 verses 1 through 14. The Tax Man One day Jesus and Peter were traveling together without Judas, who carried the money box. When they came to the village at Capernaum, a tax collector insisted that they pay a poll tax. Although Jesus felt as though they were being taxed unfairly, he instructed Peter to go down to the sea and catch the first fish that bit his hook. Then he was to look into the mouth for a shekel, a coin, and use the money to pay their tax bill. See Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. Did you catch the full impact of what just happened? Jesus commanded a fish to produce the money they needed to pay their taxes. Did the fish find the money at the bottom of the sea from some wrecked merchant ship? Or did Jesus supernaturally cause a coin to appear in the fish's mouth? I have no idea. But one thing I know, if Jesus commanded the fish to bring him money, then he certainly could command a school of fish to duplicate that miracle a thousand times if he needed to. I guess my mama was right. Money doesn't grow on trees, but maybe it does grow on seaweed. Apparently, Jesus took God's command to rule over the fish of the sea seriously because he became quite famous for impacting the fishing industry. The Gospels record Jesus supernaturally chumming the fish into the disciples' nets on at least two occasions. Take a look at the first one. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help. They came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. That's Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 7. These guys were not fishing for fun. This is how they made their living. Fishing was a middle-class, feast or famine kind of occupation. That is, until Jesus showed up. He quickly transformed a meager living into a prosperous vocation. Let's look at one more fishing expedition so we can understand that the previous story was not an isolated incident. It was the nature of Jesus to behave extravagantly. He never provided just a few more fish. Heck no! Jesus stood on a beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, 
and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were unable to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! So when Simon and Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. But the other disciple came in a little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. That's John chapter 21, verses 4 through 8. Jesus is into boat sinking, way too much, catch of the year kind of fishing. In America, we say time is money. But in the fishing business, fish are money. Jesus was not just increasing their catch. He was increasing their cash. It's worth mentioning here that if having a lot of money is a bad thing, then Jesus should have made sure that they had minimal catches. What I'm pointing out here is that if Jesus can circumvent the process of wealth creation by creating money out of thin air, or by making wine instantly from water, or by taking a boy's lunch and multiplying it 10,000 times to feed the crowd that would fill an entire NBA basketball stadium, or by increasing a fisherman's catch by a thousand percent, then there's no way he can ever be called poor, at least by worldly standards. Jesus became poor when you contrast his heavenly home with his earthly visitation. But Jesus was no homeless transient traversing the countryside with twelve vagabonds. He was actually a famous traveling rabbi who grew up in a middle-class carpenter's home and had a well-funded ministry. Funded by the Wealthy Although Jesus was born in a manger, his birth was announced with astonishing fanfare. God assigned a star to Jesus that the Magi followed to find the Messiah. The Magi were wise men from the East that later tradition holds to be three kings. These kings brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh from their treasures and presented them to Jesus at his birth. See Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. It seems to me that if you are a king who has been looking into the heavens for years in anticipation of a star that would direct you to the coming Messiah, then the birth of Christ would be a massive event for you. This is not an average birthday party where you bring a token gift. No way! This is a historic occasion, worthy of a substantial gift. In fact, the Bible says it this way, opening their treasures, they presented him gifts. They did not reach into their money bags and pull out a few dollars to buy him a birthday card. Instead, they carried treasure chests with them because they were presenting Jesus with a large kingly gift. Many scholars believe that Jesus had a substantial amount of money from the Magi treasury that launched him into his ministry. Yet traveling for three and a half years with twelve other men had to be pretty expensive. Luke the physician tells us in his gospel how Jesus created financial sustainability in his ministry. He began going from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, and Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven spirits had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chosen, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others were contributing to their support out of their private means. That's Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Jesus had several wealthy friends who helped support his needs and expenses of his ministry. Many of his biggest supporters were wealthy women. The life of Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, demonstrates the level of affluence many of Jesus' friends had. Mary poured a vial of perfume, of pure nard in fact, over Jesus' feet and wiped them with their hair. That single vial was worth as much as a year's wages. Think about it. If you can afford perfume worth an average person's annual salary, it just stands the reason that you are quite wealthy. See John chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Although Jesus did spend a lot of time with the poor and the broken, he could also be found hanging out a lot with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. They were his best friends and probably his primary financial supporters. Foxholes and Bird's Nests Much of the misunderstanding about the status of Jesus' personal financial condition comes from a story told in the Gospels with both Matthew and Luke. Jesus was walking down a road with his disciples when a guy yelled out, I will follow you wherever you go. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 57. In typical Jesus fashion, he responded, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then Jesus turned to another man and said, Follow me. 
The guy wanted to follow Jesus, but he had practical reasons why he could not leave right away. And he replied, Lord, permit me to go and bury my father. Jesus seemed a little miffed at the guy's response. He demanded, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Some people are convinced that Jesus was telling the first guy that he was homeless and that following him meant camping out on the ground. This seems like a rational assumption until we investigate a little further. Consider the story of the Last Supper. Jesus needed a place that would seat 13 men, not to mention someone to prepare a Passover meal for all of them. By the way, preparing a kosher Passover meal for a group that size is no small feat. Yet Jesus had it all handled. His disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of that house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, prepared for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. That's Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 16. We can deduce from this story and many others that the people who were supporting Jesus' ministry took really good care of him. It is therefore unlikely that Jesus would have had any problem finding housing for his disciples when they traveled. It is more likely that the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests comment had more to do with the heart of the person who was inquiring than it did with the accommodations available in that location. Especially since a few seconds later, Jesus turned to another guy and said, follow me. If Jesus were telling the first guy, I'm sorry you can't go with this, I have no accommodations for you, then why did he invite the other guy to travel with him? Again, Jesus was not homeless. Traveling Light When Jesus sent his disciples out alone on missionary journeys, he did require them to travel light. He told them, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two coats or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his support. That's Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. His reasoning was that he wanted the local people to house and care for his disciples. He considered their labor, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, and casting out demons, worthy of being paid for. Jesus went on to say, Whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his home until you leave that city. This is a brilliant strategy that noble people require to invest in their own spiritual growth by caring for the practical needs of those who are ministering to them. Not only were the disciples able to cover more ground quickly with this arrangement, but also the local people were much more likely to value something that they had to sacrifice for. Furthermore, the disciples were commissioned to release a supernatural peace on every home that lodged them so that the local townspeople were able to experience the same peace that was on the disciples' lives. Dress for Success Not only was Jesus not homeless, he actually dressed well for his day. If you compared Jesus' clothes to the people that time, you would have concluded that Jesus was at least somewhat affluent. Jesus wore a seamless tunic woven in one piece. When he was crucified, the four soldiers stripped him and cut his outer garments into four pieces so they each got something. But because his tunic was seamless, it was so valuable that the soldiers gambled for it. See John chapter 19, verses 23 through 25. Some modern theologians call his seamless tunic the Armani suit of the first century. Let me be clear. I'm not trying to propose that Jesus was a rich tycoon on earth, although he clearly had means to be one through his supernatural abilities that he demonstrated. What I am trying to point out is that Jesus was not poor by any earthly standard. He had everything he needed to take care of his team and cover their travels. He was incredibly generous, and he often helped people prosper financially, and he taught more parables about money than about any other subject. Jesus was very aware that the way people handled money was often a reflection of what was going on in their hearts. For instance, he complimented a widow who gave the last cent in an offering, and he rebuked a young ruler who cared more about riches than he did about his soul. He taught people to invest rather than bury it. He explained to us that we have to be faithful with unrighteous wealth before God will give us true riches. We will investigate these subjects further in the chapters ahead, but it should suffice to say that Jesus was no pauper. 
Well, for those of you that are curious about the rest of the story of my trip to Rome, my luggage arrived three hours before the meeting with the Pope. Thus, my reputation was preserved. By the way, I went with a brown two-piece suit with the black shirt and brown striped tie. I packed the brown suit at the last minute in the middle of the night. It's a good thing I did. Chapter 2. How to Cure a Wealth Autoimmune Disease Kathy and I sold our four businesses and moved to Redding, California in December of 1996 to start the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. The sale of our auto parts store was supposed to have provided us with about $250,000 in profit for our 20 years of hard work. Big A Auto Parts, a half billion dollar publicly traded corporation, signed a contract to purchase our auto parts stores in mid-1994. But they somehow managed to drag out the escrow for 18 months while reassuring us every week that our escrow would close next week. So we moved to Reading with their reassurance that the escrow would close very shortly. A month after we arrived at Bethel Church, Big A Corporation went bankrupt. Consequently, not only did we not have a quarter of a million dollars to live on while we were building the school, but we also suddenly owed $1.4 million. Kathy and I had agreed to volunteer until the school startup could afford to pay us, and now we had no income to pay any of our personal bills or even feed our family. Overnight, we lost everything, our business, the house our kids grew up in, and almost all of our worldly possessions. The next week, I met with Bill Johnson and the Bethel Church elders to explain our situation and let them know we were leaving. I told them that we were going to have to go bankrupt and find jobs so we could pay back as much of our debt as possible. When I finished my long, detailed explanation of our plight, one of the elders stood up and said, We're a family. Families stay together in tough times, so we don't want you to leave. Furthermore, we believe God can do the impossible, so we want to ask that you wouldn't file for bankruptcy for six months while we pray for a financial miracle for you guys. I have no faith for that, I replied honestly. Will you trust our faith for six months? He said confidently. I thought to myself, what do I have to lose? So I agreed to wait six months as the elders were requesting. I honestly had no idea what was about to happen next, nor was I prepared for the war that was going to take place inside of me as a result. The following month, we were miraculously forgiven $900,000 of our debt. A few months later, the Small Business Administration agreed to reduce our $247,000 loan to $11,000 in cash, providing we paid them in 30 days. The day before the 30 days were up, a man we did not know, directed by God in a dream, gave us a check for $30,000. You just can't make this stuff up. We were able to pay off the SBA and several other bills as well. Within the next three years, all of our debt was paid off or forgiven. Wonderful, right? Sort of, except for it unearthed a problem so deep in me that I had no idea it was even there. Many people, like the man I described above, were handing us money left and right. I took their money because I was so desperate, but I was also ashamed of myself. The idea that people would help us simply because they loved us, without any thought of getting anything returned, drove me to a crisis of soul. I avoided everyone who gave to us like a plague, not understanding why, until one special night that I will never forget for the rest of my life. In fact, that night had such a dramatic impact on my life that I have told the story in some of my previous books. I won't retell the whole thing here, but the short version is that after I had been going to great lengths to avoid this man who had given me such a generous gift, God spoke to me and told me that the reason I kept avoiding the people who gave to us is that I did not feel worthy of their love or their generosity. Throughout the night, he revealed layer after layer of self-hatred and low self-worth that had plagued me since I was a little boy. He said to me, It's time for you to love yourself the way I love you. I was stunned. We had owned nine businesses over the previous 20 years, and that night I was suddenly aware that I had a poverty mentality that was inoculating me from wealth. Although our businesses almost always performed excellently, my low self-esteem sabotaged our prosperity. Every time we begin to prosper, I would find some way to siphon off our wealth into some worthless venture. The great apostle John addressed this dynamic in prayer with those he pastored. He wrote, Beloved, I pray that in all respects that you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. That's 3 John chapter 2. 
John concluded that the foundation of all prosperity and health is relegated to our soul's prosperity. In other words, our soul's prosperity determines the level of wealth and health that we will experience. This reminds me of a saying that I heard a long time ago that goes something like this. If you need money, don't ask for money. Ask why you need money. I never understood this adage until I had that experience with the man who had given me a large sum of money. As time passed, I came to understand that if you put people in an environment around them that they perceive to be better than the environment within them, they will reduce the environment around them to match the environment that they believe they have within them. Fatal Detraction When we live in poverty of soul, our perceived unworthiness, rooted in our lack of self-love, is kind of like turning two magnets in the repelling direction. Although the repelling force is invisible, it is nevertheless a powerful and viable deterrent to any connection. Unworthiness and a lack of self-love are an invisible force field, and like those magnets, they repel prosperity and hold us in poverty. In fact, the only way for the magnetic detraction to be neutralized is for a stronger outside influence to overcome its resistance. For example, sometimes a person's skill is greater than the level of negative magnetic influence that lurks within them, which will result in seasons of external prosperity. But that kind of prosperity is never sustainable because it's impossible to overcome consistently with our talent what our negative identity and mindset is rejecting. This scenario inside of us eventually becomes something like a wealth autoimmune disease. An autoimmune disease occurs when the body's white blood cells which are assigned to fight off illness, somehow receive the wrong message. Then they rebel against their mission and attack the body itself. When we struggle with self-love, that wealth autoimmune disease kicks in, and we feel guilty for our prosperity. So we try to soothe our souls with some kind of penance. At best, this is self-sabotaging. At worst, it is self-destructive. In a similar way to healthy white blood cells, however, a wealth mindset, a mindset in which we view ourselves as sons and daughters of God, protects us from self-pity, depression, and a victim mentality. Horsepower Not long ago, I had an experience that reminded me again of this autoimmune dynamic in my own life. On July 19, 2015, Kathy and I celebrated our 40th anniversary. Kathy wanted to celebrate at Disneyland, the place where we went for our honeymoon 40 years earlier. Standing in line for hours to take a two-minute ride is not my idea of romance. Yet I really wanted to do something special for Kathy, so I joyfully concurred. A few weeks later, we arrived in the land of Disney. The next day, we were standing in line enjoying the rides when Kathy told me that she wanted to buy me something special for our anniversary, and she was wondering what I wanted. I was ready. I shouted, a yellow Corvette Stingray! I knew Kathy was not super excited about me driving a fast car, especially a bright yellow sports car. She stared in my eyes for a long time, and then she proclaimed, If that's what you really want, then I want you to have it. A month later, a bright yellow 2014 Corvette pulled up in our driveway. It was almost new, stunningly beautiful, and incredibly fast. I was beside myself for days. I had grown up around cars and had always loved Corvettes. In my teen years, I built four Corvette models. Moreover, my grandfather owned the first service station in Mountain View, California, and I followed in his footsteps, owning four automotive repair shops and three auto parts stores. So I guess you could say cars are kind of in my blood. I really love my Corvette, but I decided not to drive it to work. I'm a pastor at Bethel Church. My staff kept asking me when I was going to bring my car to work so they could see it, but I kept avoiding answering their question. A week passed before I finally decided to think through my dilemma. What exactly is my problem, I asked myself. I decided that the best way to discover what was troubling me was to drive my vet to work and see what fears forced their way to the surface. When I arrived at work, several staff members rushed out to see my car. They kept walking around the car, ooh, wow, ah, and asking questions. How fast does it go? How much horsepower does it have? What year is it? Yet I found myself answering questions nobody was asking. It's used, I said sheepishly. We got a great deal on it. Kathy bought it for me. Pastor Joe's Escalade cost more than mine, I declared. A few minutes later, back in the office, I was regretting buying the car. People are going to think I'm showing off, I mused. A pastor has no business owning a beautiful car like this. What are people going to say about me? 
The questions plague me. An hour later, my good friend Dan Fairley came in my office. Beautiful car, dude, he said with a grin. Yeah, I sort of feel bad for buying it, I responded. What? Why, he shot back. Dude, you're a car guy. This is a perfect car for you. You deserve it. You have the money for it. Dude, enjoy your car, he insisted. What are people going to think, I pressed. If they can't rejoice with you, then it's their problem. Don't worry about it, he said confidently. From that day on, I drove my Corvette to work every day. Most people loved it and told me how much they liked the fact that a car guy finally got his dream car. I decided to face down my fears by posting a picture of my vet on my social networking pages and thanking Kathy publicly for the car. The results were surprisingly positive, with a few exceptions. There's an accuser in every crowd, of course, especially on Facebook, but hundreds of people posted really encouraging comments. The moral of the story is that it's okay to have nice things as long as those things don't have you. Sometimes, having wonderful things is a sign of something beautiful going on in the heart of a person who's forging his way or her way out of poverty mentality. Trouble in Paradise Jesus said, You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's Matthew chapter 19, verse 19. It's surprising how much of an impact this two-letter word, as, can have on a person's life. Your neighbors, coworkers, family members, and friends are all being dramatically affected by this two-letter word. In fact, I propose that this tiny word is in charge of your finances, rules your emotional state, and dictates how you relate to God. What? You protest? That's ridiculous. Let me explain my thesis. The word as means the same. In other words, love your neighbor the same way or to the same level as you love yourself. Since love looks like something, your behavior towards your neighbor is a reflection of how you feel about yourself. Another way to say it is that the best thing you can do for other people around you is to love yourself. The great Apostle Paul echoes these sentiments when he says, Husbands ought to love your wives as you love your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. There's that tiny word as again. But this time, instead of helping a neighbor, it's saving a marriage. This two-letter word demands an answer to a profound question. How do you feel about you? You may have been taught that humility requires you to feel bad about yourself, or at least not feel good about who you are. Nothing can be further from the truth. Humility does not dictate how you feel about yourself, but it determines how you express your love to those around you. It is humility that requires the love you have for yourself to benefit those around you. For example, when people are telling a story about something they've accomplished and you have a better story, it is humility that whispers, let them have the best story of the day. Give them the spotlight. It is self-love that makes it easy to give others the stage because your soul is not starving for affection or clamoring for attention. Extending God's love to ourself first lays the foundation for us to radically love those around us. On the other hand, when we starve our souls of love, we have no source to draw from to truly love others. True humility is actually derailed by self-hatred and undermined by low self-esteem. This is because humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. On the other hand, all self-demeaning thoughts center your attention on your sense of lack, drawing away your affection for God and others. Humility means you are teachable, influenceable, correctable, and vulnerable. Humility can learn from the least, is moved by a child, embraces a rebuke, and lives in authenticity. Humility lets others take the bow while you take a seat. It is honor in action and love authenticated. True humility means that you recognize your need without condemning your soul. Prayer is therefore humility expressed towards God, while thankfulness is humility expressed in gratitude. Get a grip. Hopefully by now you are convinced that loving yourself is the key to a prosperous soul, which is the foundation for becoming wealthy and healthy in every area of your life. The questions that press against your soul in getting there involve how and what. Or more specifically, How do I learn to love myself, and what is the process out of the prison of poverty? 
There are eight simple, profound steps to walking out of poverty and into his prosperous soul. Number one, who does God say you are? There are hundreds of scriptures that reveal your amazing identity in Jesus. I will walk you through a few of them just to give you a head start on your journey out of Pauperville and into the palace. The Apostle Paul said, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The connotation is that you used to be a sinner, someone whose nature was to sin and to do evil. Sin was not just something you did, it was actually your identity. But when you received Jesus into your life, you were born again. See John chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. You became a saint, meaning a holy believer. It's no longer your nature to sin because you are a holy person, a citizen of a holy nation. See 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Furthermore, when you asked Jesus into your life, you became a son or daughter of God himself. So now you are encouraged to call your heavenly father daddy. But wait, it gets even better. You are seated on a throne next to Jesus, and you were created to reign with him throughout eternity because you are his bride. The bride part is a little hard for us guys to wrap our brains around, but I guess if the ladies can become sons of God, certainly we men can figure out how to be the bride of Christ. The Apostle Paul gave us one of my favorite revelations of our identity in Christ. He said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The Greek word new in this passage means prototype or something never before created. You are a prototype creature, molded by your Father, modeled after Jesus Christ, infused with miracle power, and filled with the wisdom from another age. It's really hard to feel bad about yourself when you are a forerunning prototype never before graced this planet child of God. I want to inspire you to journey through the scriptures and unearth the full revelation of the mystery of your identity in God. He is waiting eagerly for you to encounter His indescribable, outrageous love for you so that you might be awakened to your new fantastic future. Number two, envision yourself as God sees you. I had discovered a principle in the kingdom that simply says, if I can envision it, I can have it. That's not to say that we can selfishly name and claim anything we want, so stay with me. The author of the book of Hebrews puts it like this, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that were visible. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. In other words, everything that God created in the invisible realm is a manifestation of his imagination. The book of Genesis says that God made us in his own image and likeness, That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. What God imagined, we became, and apparently he was imagining himself because we were made in his likeness. The wisest king in the world, Solomon, articulated it like this. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. There is something very powerful about your imagination, which many people from the dark side have perverted, causing most believers to rarely tap into it. Yet it is vision that shapes our lives and directs our destinies. What you imagine has a huge effect on who you are becoming. You are forming your outer world with your inner thoughts. When Moses died, his protege Joshua took on nearly an impossible task of leading the children of Israel out of the wilderness in which they wandered for 40 miserable years and into a promised land. After decades of determination and anguish, Moses had failed in his divine mission leaving the task to his willing but fearful general. God met Joshua immediately after the death of his faithful leader and gave him some simple but profound insights on how to apprehend his divine destiny successfully. The message was direct but encouraging. Three times in five minutes, God exhorted Joshua, Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. See Joshua chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. It's darn hard to not be afraid when you are tasked with getting 1.5 million civilians into their promised land, which is inhabited by enemies and infested with giants, not to mention the fact that the Israelites had no solution for how to cross the Jordan River. Yet in the midst of God's dialogue with Joshua, he gave him incredible insight. God said if Joshua would do three simple things, that he would make his way prosperous, and he would have success. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 tells us what those three things were. Number one, 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Number two, you shall meditate on it day and night. Number three, you shall be careful to do according to all that's written in it. These three simple steps have the power to radically alter the course of your life forever. Let's make them practical for you. First of all, get your face in the Bible and find out what God has to say about you and yours. Second, train your tongue to talk as though you believe what God says more than you believe what you see, feel, or fear. And third, meditate on the stuff that you're reading when you have your face in the book. The word meditate means to imagine, to think about, to envision, to talk to yourself, and even to sing the truth over yourself. If your singing is really bad, I suggest humming, as there's no sense in singing yourself into a tizzy. (laughs) Next, take action. What things did you meditate on that require action? Get busy creating action points for all your identity insights, and soon you will have a wealth mentality. Number three, recount the sins and failures troubling you and ask forgiveness. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about staring at your belly button or spending your days in regret. I'm merely saying that if you are still plagued by any past failure or failures or sin or sins, then deal with them head on. You need to recount your past sins and failures that still trouble you and ask Jesus to forgive you. You cannot conquer what you refuse to confront, and buried shame is more dominant than unapplied redemption. Yet closure is so easy in Jesus that it's almost embarrassing. The Apostle John said it best, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. There it is, short and sweet. Confess your sins, and he does the rest. God does not forgive excuses. He only forgives sins. Some people never live in peace because they are too arrogant, stubborn, or afraid, etc., to admit that they screwed up. It was their fault. They got it wrong. So many people ask God for mercy, but refuse to admit that they failed. Yet mercy means you did not get what you deserved, which is punishment. In order to receive mercy, you have to have done something wrong and confess it. Otherwise, mercy goes unapplied. When you confess your sins, God forgives them and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. God actually is able to fix your root issues, cleanse you from impure motives, and release you from all addictions. He has power over anything that would imprison you, punish you, or reduce you. How do you unleash all heaven's power in your life? Confess your sins and repent. To repent means to view your sins from God's perspective and therefore think about sin the way He does. Number four, ask Jesus to show you your sins or failures from his perspective. Let's look at a beautiful picture of this in the book of Zechariah. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand, accusing him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festive robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. At Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. I love the graphic depiction of Joshua the high priest, a different Joshua than Moses' successor, because it is such a powerful picture of the full spectrum of the process of forgiveness. There is Joshua, the guilty soul, who like all of us has messed up his life in one way or another. There is Satan, who's the pesty fly that just will not go away, accusing us day and night. And of course, there is also the Lord, our Savior, friend, and Redeemer, who is vicious in dealing with the devil. He rebukes the dang devil and immediately commands the angels to help us take off our filthy rags of life and clothe us in the robes of righteousness. It is so important, especially when you fail, that you see yourself from God's merciful perspective Envisioning your failure through the eyes of Jesus is essential to assigning right roles to the proper characters in life. 
There is the loud voice shouting, Guilty! Away to the gallows with this one! Off with his head! But it's not the Lord convicting you. It's Satan trying to mess with your head. Satan's goal is to get your eyes off the Lord's redemption and on your failures. But in the midst of all the shouting and hoopla, there's always the reassuring voice of the shepherd, reminding us of his great power to liberate you from your failures and the devil's plan for your demise. Stay in that quiet place of seeking him and see things from his perspective until you can see your failings transformed into his fantastic future for you. Number five, ask Jesus about cleanup and closure and take action. If Jesus shows you that there are actions you need to take to clean up your mess or messes and or to bring closure to your life, then take action and take care of it. The Bible says that we need to bear fruit of repentance. See Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. Most of the time, this simply means asking people who we have wronged to forgive us and doing what we can to right our wrongs. It's important to note here that you are responsible to do your part, but you cannot make someone forgive you. Nor is it your job to convince people to exonerate you. Let the Holy Spirit do His part in convincing other people who are involved to reciprocate your response. It's also important that you don't do penance, which looks like you are working for forgiveness or allowing yourself to be punished for your failures. Jesus forgave you and released you from punishment. Period. Case closed. You are free. Whenever you punish yourself or allow others to punish you for the wrong you did, you're insulting Jesus. You are saying to God through the sign language of your life that what Jesus did for you on the cross was not good enough for you. Just do your part and then let God use his all-powerfulness to do his part supernaturally. Number six, develop a vetting system for yourself, a truth wall. It is important to develop a vetting system or a truth wall for what you allow yourself to listen to and think about. This is a huge part of a wealth mentality. Jesus gave us profound insights on how the vetting process affects our lives when he said, take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you and more will be given to you besides. I pondered these verses for years, asking myself what it means, especially the more besides part. In the middle of a marketing class, I got my answer. It was 2016, and my team and I were at a workshop on internet marketing taught by a world-class instructor. Anytime we go to a class like this, nobody wants to sit next to me because I'm such a tech klutz. Somehow, I always manage to embarrass my team by asking the stupidest questions. This instructor was explaining how internet algorithms function, automated reasoning, and how we can use this technology to spread the message of the kingdom. He showed us how the internet allows everyone's activity on the internet to be tracked and recorded for life. He explained that there are programs that analyze the statistical data to determine people's interests, desires, and passions. This software facilitates target marketing to specific groups of people by vetting people's desires so anyone who has something to sell can present it to people who have a proven interest in that product or service. In other words, what you have watched or listened to creates desire paths called algorithms that are used to encourage you to buy things from organizations that specialize in a specific product or service. For example, if you do something wrong, like look at porn on the internet, porn sites will determine through algorithms, automated reasoning, what you watch and will send you more of the same via ads and porn pictures. As the instructor was explaining this for like the fifth time, as I said, I'm a little slow on this sort of thing, it suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks, and I shouted, There are algorithms in the Spirit! Now I understand the verse that has eluded me for 20 years! Of course, nobody there had any idea what I was talking about at the time, but think about it. The things you like listening to invite more of the same in the Spirit. Take care of what you listen to, because by your measure, it will be measured to you. In other words, like the internet, you determine what you pay attention to. Then by your standard, According to your own desires, it will be measured to you as people around you give you what you have an appetite for. But more will be given to you besides. You will also have things presented to you that you did not ask for or even seek after, much like the pop-up ads on your computer screen. The spirit realm operates much like the internet. When you choose to entertain certain kinds of thoughts, maybe for you it is worry and fear, you invite other worriers and fearful people into your world. 
It's true what they say, the birds of a feather flock together. And other people whom you have no connection to and no desire to know will mysteriously find you. On the other hand, if you watch over your heart and mind with all diligence and vet your thoughts through God's divine filter, then you will attract like-minded people to you. Furthermore, this principle works in the unseen realm, in that your thoughts attract or resist different kinds of spiritual influences in your life. I like to say it this way, angels and demons travel at the speed of thought. Number seven, make and memorize a list of the five most profound things Jesus says about you. The goal of this exercise is to help you develop new, positive ways of thinking that will assist you in beginning a new powerful and peaceful life that originates from the kingdom within you. When you proactively spend time pondering the things Jesus says about you, you create new neural pathways in your brain. Neural pathways are the roads in your brain that thoughts travel on. I once heard a neuroscientist describe the creation of neural pathways by comparing the process to dropping a hot steel ball bearing into a pound of cheese. The ball bearing represents a thought, and the cheese represents your brain. Simply stated, whenever you think about a subject, it forges a pathway in your brain, making it easier for you to think about the same subject again, kind of like the path you would create in the physical by walking through a wheat field. The more you entertain the same thoughts, the wider the road becomes in your mind. If you think positive, healthy thoughts a couple times a week, but spend most of your time thinking about negative, hopeless, destructive thoughts, then metaphorically speaking, you built a six-lane freeway to the prison camp while barely hewing out a walking trail to your divine destiny. The neural pathways you create become mindsets that tend to dictate how you think and what you visualize most easily. Of course, the science of neural pathways is much more complicated than this childlike explanation, but it helps to consider a simple illustration to understand how you can proactively affect your outlook on life. You may have grown up in a family who feasted at the pig trough of ungodly thinking, but you have the power to change all that. It's important to understand that whatever you cultivate in your mind will dominate. When you remember what Jesus thinks about you and meditate on the profound attributes he shows you, about yourself, you are proactively building roads in your mind, and ultimately you are altering your destiny. The Apostle Paul gave us insight into this subject when he admonished the Roman believers, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The truth is, you can't change your life, but if you change your thoughts, Jesus will transform your life. Number 8. Ask how your attributes should affect your actions and do accordingly, no matter how you feel. Ask yourself how someone who has all the five attributes that Jesus said you have, the list you just memorized, should think, talk, behave, and dream. Then do accordingly, no matter how you feel. Nothing is quite so affirming and confidence-building as acting out your God thoughts instead of your feelings. Your feelings, although important, are great servants but terrible masters. I'm reminded of God's counsel to Cain when jealousy was plaguing the guy. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. That's Genesis chapter 4, verses 5-7. through seven. Did you notice how doing well or not doing well was directly related to Cain's countenance and his attitude? When you act on the things that Jesus says about you, you forge the truth into your heart and accelerate the transformation process in your mind. If you have spent your life with a poverty mentality, then thinking and acting differently may not feel real or authentic at first, but persevere, because 30 days from now, there will be a new you. Let me close this chapter by reminding you that you were born to win, that Jesus is in your corner, if God is for you, then who can be against you? Chapter 3 Why All Believers Should Be Wealthy, Not Rich The idea that all believers should be wealthy seems offensive, arrogant, and prideful at best, and ignorant, exaggerated, and misleading at worst. Yet it's 100% true all the time. Now before you decide to jump off the ship and swim to familiar island, let me be clear that not every believer should be rich, because rich and wealthy are two completely different things. Let me contrast poverty, riches, and wealth for you, 
and see if you can agree with me. I have found that one of the easiest ways to explain otherwise difficult subjects is by contrasting two opposing ideas with one another. It's amazing how viewing things in contrasting descriptions can clarify and qualify truth. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, the wisest king who ever lived often used contrasting truths held in tension to reveal ageless wisdom. Here are a few examples of Solomon's writings. Ill-gotten gains do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 2. He who gathers in the summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in the harvest is a son who acts shamefully. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5. The wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will be ruined. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 8. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. Now let me demonstrate the difference between people who engage in wealth thinking and people who focus on poverty thinking by contrasting these two perspectives with one another. It will be easy to grasp these rather complex concepts through these simple illustrations. Number one, poverty lives for today, but wealth leaves legacy. Number two, poverty finds a problem in every opportunity, while wealth finds an opportunity in every problem. Number three, poverty feels entitled, while wealth feels empowered. Number four, poverty fears the future, while wealth makes history. Number five, poverty blames others for its condition, but wealth takes responsibility for things that are not its fault. Number six, poverty asks, what are you going to do for me? Wealth asks, who is worthy of my investment? Number seven, poverty hangs around with other disgruntled sorts who validate its accusations, but wealth surrounds itself with powerful influencers. Number eight, poverty votes for candidates who will increase its entitlement, while wealth elects officials who will sacrifice today's comfort for tomorrow's children. Now let's contrast the difference between rich mindsets and wealth mindsets. As I said, rich and wealthy are two very different things. Number one, rich people get their identity from the things they own, their houses, cars, yachts, money, etc. Wealthy people's identity comes from who they are, not what they own. Number two, rich people either spend a lot of time trying to not lose their money or spend time wasting it on themselves. Wealthy people's money is just an expression of who they are. They are confident in their well-being. Number three, rich people work for money, while wealthy people's money works for them. Number four, rich people think of their assets, but wealthy people dream of their legacy. Number five, rich people give to people. Wealthy people invest in people with an expectation of a return on their investment measured by a predetermined outcome. Examples are a changed life, a transformed neighborhood, a business profit, etc. Number six, rich people think their money protects them. They have a sense of being above the law. Solomon put it like this, a rich man's wealth is a strong city, like a high wall in his own imagination. That's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 11. But wealthy people are inherently humble because they are thankful, knowing that the source of their provision is the Lord. Number seven, rich people have a vision for things they can buy. Wealthy people have a vision for the legacy they are leaving. Number eight, rich people compete for money. Wealthy people are compelled by destiny. Number nine, rich people step on others to move up. Wealthy people measure their success by the people they help up. Number 10, the rich person's business goal is to make money, whereas a wealthy person's profession yields profit as the fruit of serving others well. These contrasts are not meant to be the last word on poverty, riches, and wealth. They are simple comparisons to help explain how people in each of these mindsets think. They also help explain why many people are rich, but far fewer of them are wealthy. Furthermore, because true wealth is first a condition of the heart that affects the world around you, is not necessarily related to how much money you have in the bank, there are many wealthy people who don't have a lot of assets. Generosity, the key to prosperity. Let's begin to unearth the secrets of the outrageously wealthy 
and unleash prosperity on your soul. One of the best kept secrets of the principles of prosperity is generosity, because your generosity determines the capacity of your distribution system that reciprocates your investment in the kingdom. Let me begin to explain it by quoting Jesus. He said, Give, and it shall be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. That's Luke chapter 6, verse 38. All prosperity begins with give, which means that everyone in the world has a capacity for wealth. Think about it like this. If prosperity began with receive instead of give, then each of us would be powerless to produce wealth until someone decided to contribute to our welfare. In other words, it would be then rational to blame your poor condition on the actions of others. But because you initiate all prosperity in your life with give, you determine when you activate your heavenly endowment to receive God's divine power to produce wealth. But I grew up in a poor family, you complain, but I have nothing to give. I'm sorry, but you are wrong. Look at the verse again. It does not say, give money and it shall be given to you. Jesus just said, give and it shall be given to you. Everyone has something to give. You can give your time, your gifts, your wisdom, your strength, your encouragement, your talents, etc. You are a treasure chest of true riches, a wealth of benefit to others. Think about what a robot would be worth if it could perform one-tenth of the tasks you're capable of. If you underestimate your ability to give, you will undermine your capacity to receive. Thus, you could unconsciously relegate your substance to the pig farm instead of the father's house. The second part of this verse that is equally profound is, For by your standard of measure, it shall be measured to you in return. Metaphorically speaking, if you give God a teaspoon of rice, He will use the teaspoon, your measure, to give you back ten teaspoons of gold. If you give God a bucket of rice, He will use your bucket, your measure, to give you back ten buckets of gold. I heard a beautiful story about rice years ago that illustrates this perfectly. It goes something like this. There was once an old barefoot peasant walking down the road, and he was carrying a small wooden bowl of rice. Holding the bowl close to his face, he was carefully scraping each kernel of rice into his mouth with his bare hands. Suddenly, the sound of a hundred horses filled the air. The peasant glanced up from his bowl to observe all the commotion. A thick dust cloud stretched to the heavens, shaded the sun rays from the wretched man's eyes. Yet he perceived through the dust a large, shiny gold chariot encompassed by an entourage of beautiful horses ridden by knights in the glistening armor. As the chariot approached, the ground trembled from the pounding of the horse's hooves, and the cloud of dust covered the peasant's weary head. He pulled his tattered shawl over his weathered face to shield his eyes from the onslaught, and maybe to hide his face in shame. He cursed the king's entourage under his breath, grumbling about the gall of the rich man's inconsiderate arrogance. The mere pace of the king's entourage and the breath of his train stuck in the craw of the peasant man's heart. Abruptly, the chariot came to a halt beside the peasant. The old peasant peered carefully through his shawl, waiting for the dust to pass over him. The wealthy king, his crown gleaming with jewels, slowly opened the door of his chariot. The peasant hid his face in shame as the rich king graciously spoke. May I have some of your rice, please? The king requested to the bewilderment of everyone. The peasant lifted his shawl over his face. As if retreating, he mumbled something under his breath. His shaky hand emerged reluctantly from beneath his shawl, carefully measuring three kernels of rice into the king's hand. The king, filled with gratitude, kindly thanked the old peasant. Then he opened his treasure chest and slowly counted out three gold coins, placing each of them carefully in the peasant's outstretched hand. As the king's entourage began moving again and made its way past the peasant, he ripped off his ragged outer garments, tossing them to the ground, and he yelled, Oh, that I would have given him the whole bowl of rice. I think the moral of the story is pretty clear. Your level of generosity determines the level of God's blessing in your life. The poorer you perceive yourself to be, the more important it is for you to give of yourself. The Antidote for Poverty One of the most insightful passages in the entire Bible about destroying the poverty spirit in your life is in the book of Psalms. The psalmist wrote, 
Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms chapter 126, verses 5 and 6. It would be easy to miss the profound point of this passage. I believe the psalmist is telling the story of someone who needs the very seed he's sowing to feed his children. That is why he's sowing the seed with tears. But he understands that if he does not sow the seed when he is broke, then he will not have a crop the next season. He knows that he would be destining himself to poverty since without a crop he would have no income. In order to change the economic level of your life, you have to give when you are in need, when it is inconvenient, when you don't feel like it. Let me use the farm story to demonstrate how to give your way out of poverty. Let's suppose that you have 100 acres of farmland and you plant seed in 50 acres and then you use the rest of the seed for food. When harvest time comes, you produce a good wheat crop off of the 50 acres. The next year, you sacrifice some of your wheat seed you were going to eat and instead you plant 75 acres of ground. The following year, you sacrifice again, and this time you have seed from 75 acres to work with, so you plant the entire 100 acres. The point is simple. The more seed you plant, the more you harvest, and the more you harvest, the more seed you had to plant. Soon, you will have broken the life cycle of poverty by sacrificing today's comfort for tomorrow's prosperity. Lessons from the Farm Here are a few more lessons you can learn from the farm. Number one, the Apostle Paul put it like this, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, so he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. I think we have already made this point pretty clearly, but because it is the foundation of all prosperity, let me repeat it. Wealth is not determined by what you have. It is predicated by what you give away. Furthermore, the level of your generosity is not measured by the size of anyone's gift but by what is left over in your care after you give. Jesus taught us this principle when he told a story about a bunch of people giving a lot of money in the temple. Then a widow came up to the offering box and put in two pennies. Jesus said that she gave more than all the rest because she gave everything she had. That is, she had nothing left. See Luke chapter 21 verses 1 through 4. Number two, the next thing we can learn from the farm is is that you reap what you sow. The Bible says it best, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this is also what he will reap. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. The book of Genesis lays this principle out this way, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. Genesis chapter 1, verse 12. If you plant in your customers, It will help your business, but will not fix your marriage. If you give yourself to people, you will have wealth of friends, but it will probably not affect your bank account. I think you get the idea. God created everything after its kind, so you reap what you sow. If you need money, then you must sow monetary things into the soil of your desperation to reap an economic harvest of prosperity. Number three, it's important to remember that you always are eating last year's crop. Some people live a selfish life for many years and then suddenly decide to be generous. A month later, they are already discouraged because, quote, nothing has happened yet. Changing life cycles is a process that requires patience and perseverance. If you persist, you will prosper in whatever area you sow into. Watchful Insights I have learned so many of these lessons the hard way. When Kathy and I came to Bethel Church in 1998, we were really broke but somebody gave us some money for my birthday and I decided to buy a watch with it. I had never owned nor wore a watch before because I grew up working on cars and watches just got in the way. I bought a beautiful Seiko watch for $110, which was a lot of money for me at the time. The next day we were in church worshiping God when a guy behind me whispered, Hey, that's a nice watch. Let me see it. I reluctantly took it off my hand and gave it to him. A half hour later, the guy handed me his watch and said, I'll trade you for mine. I honestly did not want to trade. I had only owned the watch for less than a day. Not only that, but I liked the way my watch looked better than the way his did. 
but I did not want to embarrass myself, so after a little haggling, I agreed to the exchange. A few days later, I took the watch he had traded me into the jewelry store to have the band sized. This band was too small for my wrists, so I had to add some extra links. The salesman who was sizing the band commented on how beautiful the watch was, so I told him, a guy traded me for this watch for my Seiko. Wow, you got the better end of the deal, he said as he reached into the glass case and retrieved a new watch exactly like the one I had brought in. He then showed me the price tag, which was $1,500. That's a Movado watch. They're pretty expensive, he insisted. I was so embarrassed by my selfish attitude towards the guy who had traded me watches, I could hardly believe my eyes. I had given the guy a $110 watch, and he had given me a $1,500 watch. Yikes! Talk about the great exchange. I was stunned. A year later, I was teaching in Fiji at a YWAM base. When the base leader saw my Movado watch, he fell in love with it. He said jokingly, I think you're supposed to give me that watch. No way, I joked back. You're listening to the wrong spirit. For the next five days, we bantered back and forth about my watch, with him insisting I should give it to him. Finally, the night before we were leaving, I heard the Lord tell me to give the guy the watch. I responded, no way. The Lord replied, if you give him your watch, I'll give you a better one. The next morning at breakfast, I presented my friend with my watch. Oh no, I couldn't take that watch from you, he insisted. Shut up, dude. You've been trying to get this watch for five days. You are taking it. He finally agreed to accept it, and I was happy he did. Because before I left Fiji, I had a brand new black and gold Rado watch. It was the most awesome timepiece I had ever seen. Two years passed, and I was in Romania teaching at a couple of conferences with two of my close friends. Romania is a very poor country, and the pastors there barely make enough money to survive. The second day we were there, the Lord told me to give my radio watch to one of the local pastors. I asked God, what deal are you making with me this time? God said, no deal. Give the pastor your watch. That's the deal. I really love the watch, and I was not in a financial position to replace it, so I was not excited about giving it away. When I resisted this time, the Lord was not so gracious to me. He said, when you had a little, you were willing to obey me. But now that you have a lot, you are disobedient. Don't worry about giving the pastor your watch. I'll just reduce your prosperity down to your ability to obey. That way, you won't have to be led into temptation. I immediately gave the pastor my watch, which brings up a fourth point that is another lesson you can learn from the farm. Number four. Sometimes the level of your obedience determines the level of your prosperity. Some people believe that if they had a lot, then they would be generous. But Jesus said, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. That's Luke chapter 16, verse 10. In other words, true wealth is predicated on the generosity of your soul, not on your family lineage, your level of intelligence, or your positive personal outlook. The truth is that every believer is called to be generous, and when you give to God, He gives back to you 30, 60, and 100 times more. So if it is true that we are all sons and daughters of God, then it stands to reason that all of us are called to be wealthy. Chapter 4 Extraordinary Franchise Opportunities Available Franchises are one of the most successful ways to start a business because you are partnering with a company that has systematized a profitable venture that is tried and true. One of the best franchises in American history, rated number two in the world, is McDonald's. You can buy a McDonald's franchise for somewhere around one to two million dollars, plus eight percent of the gross sales of your business for life. But what I've learned recently is that the best franchise in the universe is a heavenly one. That's right. T.D. Jakes helped me to understand that God is the great franchiser of the universe. Let me explain. A while back, I tuned in on TV just in time to hear T.D. Jakes preaching on tithing in a way that only he can. He had a huge bag of dimes, and he was walking down the aisles of his megachurch, throwing the dimes into the congregation. As near as I could tell, he was shouting something like, You can make God your business partner for just 10 cents. God has business franchises available for only 10 cents. How would you like to be in business with God of the universe for just 10 cents? Brothers and sisters, You would have to be a fool not to want to be in business with God who knows the future and owns a cattle on a thousand hills. 
I'd already been tithing for 30 years when I heard T.G.'s message, but I did not fully understand the principle that I had tapped into. Then while Reverend Jakes was preaching, scriptures that had been a mystery to me for decades were suddenly revealed to me like buried treasure in a hidden field. Malachi chapter 3, which was previously one of the most troubling passages in the Bible for me, suddenly made perfect sense. Let's take a close look at it together. God said, Will man rob God? that you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, and you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8-12 through 12. I understood that God wants us to be generous, and I knew that He honors our giving. But this is different. God is accusing Israel of stealing from Him because they stopped tithing. What's up with that? Then I realized that God had partnered with Israel for their prosperity. Metaphorically speaking, he had franchised the earth out to them. He had provided favorable conditions for their farms to succeed, blessing the soil and causing rain to fall at the right time and making the sunshine on their crops and so forth. They, on the other hand, had provided the labor, tilling the ground, pruning the vines, and harvesting the crops. God's franchise deal was 90-10. The farmers kept 90% of the profit, but God, for his part, required the first 10% to be his. As the ultimate philanthropist, God wanted his portion of the prophets to be given to the priests who have spiritual oversight to his people. But the farmers stopped making their franchise payments to God and instead spent the money on themselves. As you can see from the scriptures above, our Heavenly Father was not very happy with them ripping him off. In fact, he had already removed the franchise greenhouse effect that caused their crops to produce extraordinary yields and protected their vines from the elements. I love the way God deals with his franchisees. He says to them, test me now on this. In other words, give me back my franchise fee and watch how it affects your crop yields. He is gracious and forgiving with them. Even though they have broken their agreement, he promises them that if they make things right with him, he will add a supernatural element to their farming efforts. This will cause their vines to produce ridiculous yields, so much so that it will shock the surrounding nations. Questionable conduct. Let's digress for a moment and talk through some heart issues before we go on. Probably the most frequently asked questions about kingdom finance are focused on the subject of the tithe. Questions like these come up all the time. Is a tithe a New Testament principle or relegated to the Old Covenant? What exactly is a tithe? Whom shall I give my tithe to and what's in it for me? These are great questions, but before I answer them, I always like to ask the inquiring person, are you trying to give more or trying to give less? I've been asked these tithe questions more than a hundred times and only once in 20 years was the person who was doing the inquiring trying to give more. Most often the people who are debating these questions have other agendas that they are often not aware of. That said, let me ask you four questions that may help you to come to grips with the root cause of any struggle you have with tithing. Number one, do you trust God to take care of you? Here's a great scripture that will help you move forward in your quest to grow in trusting God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Number two, do you honor the leaders over you who give an account for your life? The writer of Hebrews gives us insight into the heavy responsibility that God has entrusted to his spiritual leaders. But in an age when family values are being exchanged for independence and even rebellion, this verse feels as if it's written to the Martians or at least to some caveman. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. That's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. To state the obvious, if you cannot honor your leaders in the sense of trusting them to steward well whatever you give, 
Perhaps you ought to be under a different leadership. Number three, are you serving mammon, the spirit of greed and materialism, or God? You will always protect the God that you are loyal to. Jesus put it best, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Number four, are you afraid of not having enough? I love the fact that the God of heaven cares about practical needs we have on the earth. Jesus reassured us that the Father takes care of us with these words. Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. If you are struggling with this subject of tithing, I want to challenge you right now to put down this book and ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Ask Him if your resistance is really rooted in the theology of the tithe, or if there are deeper issues that trouble you. Let Him lead you into all truth and deliver you from poverty, the fear of lack, and the need for control. In the beginning It has always astonished me that the God of the universe actually has any interest in humans giving Him gifts at all, much less money. If you are God, what are you going to do with all the stuff? It is not as though there is a grocery store or a supermarket or something that God visits. If He wants anything, He just speaks it, and it is His. Let there be Pepsi. And bam! He's drinking a cold one. So what's up with all this giving to God? That's a great question. Yet there is one thing that God wants, but which He cannot make happen, to be freely loved. God gave us a free will so that He could experience us freely giving our love to Him. Love, by its very nature, requires freedom of choice. Love forced or love programmed is not love at all. God is love, which means He has the capacity to both give love and to be loved. Because love believes all things, our trusting in God is a manifestation of loving Him. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. God can discern a gift that is given out of obligation or manipulation from a gift that is rooted in love. This is evidence in the story of Cain and Abel. Here's a short account. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. That's Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. A few things come to light in this story. First, the need to give back to God is deeply rooted in human nature, so much so that Cain received no sympathy for giving God a crummy offering, even though he did it without God asking for it. I think God had no regard for Cain's offering because he had no respect for Cain's motives. In other words, God refused to be manipulated by Cain's gift. It's like having a teenage son who's in complete rebellion against you, and then he picks some old wilted flowers out of your garden and hands them to you. You'd be thinking, what's the catch? What is he trying to bribe me into again? Unlike Cain, Abel gave God the first and best of his flock as a precious gift, and God loved it. There lies the beauty of our wonderful Creator, basking in the love of his mere mortal creature, giving Abel a pathway of expression to unleash the passion that gushed within him for his God. More than a thousand years before Moses ever wrote the law that required the people of God to give their Creator the first and the best, Abel already was loving God freely with an extravagant gift. Tithing into Eternity Now let's journey forward several hundred years to the days of Abraham. It's about 2000 BC, several centuries before Moses would carry the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. Abraham and his nephew Lot agreed to go their own separate ways to settle a conflict between their herdsmen. Lot and his people go down to the city of Sodom and settle there, while Abraham settles in the land of Canaan. See Genesis chapter 13. Time passes and a war breaks out between several cities, which results in the city of Sodom being ransacked and its citizens being taken into captivity. When Abraham hears about the plight of Sodom and the captivity of his nephew Lot, he gathers 318 of his men and sets out to rescue the city. Miraculously, Abraham defeats five attacking kings with his small band of warriors and liberates Sodom, 
ultimately freeing Lot and his family from the clutches of the enemy. See Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 through 16. This is a pretty wild story, right? But wait, it gets even better. Suddenly a man who has no beginning and no end steps onto the battlefield. His name is Melchizedek, and he greets Abraham with some bread and wine. Abraham gives this mystery man a tenth of all the spoil he has recovered from the battle. See Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24. The author of the book of Hebrews says that when Abraham tied to Melchizedek, Levi also tied to him. See Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. At first glance, this seems pretty vanilla until you realize that at that point, when Abraham gave a tithe, Levi was yet to be born. He would not be born for another three generations. A man tithe who had not even been born yet, yet he received a blessing because he was the great-grandson of Abraham. Now let me put this together for you. Abraham ties to Melchizedek, who lives in eternity because he has no beginning and no end. So he reaps a legacy in that his great-grandson gets credit for his great-grandfather's righteous generosity. Levi has inherited multi-generational favor simply being the descendant of a man who lived with eternal values. This story illustrates three important facts about tithing. First of all, Abraham tithed to God centuries before the law of Moses required it. This, of course, demonstrates that the tithe precedes the law. Second, Abraham is called the father of faith as he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. Abraham tithed by faith, not out of obligation. And the third is Abraham's tithe positively impacted generations after him because the tithe is an eternal principle. God lays down the law. Have you ever had someone give you a gift that you really could not use? Sure, we all have. I am certain that is where we get the expression, it's the thought that counts. As you can see throughout the Bible, righteous people gave God gifts and their beautiful heart of generosity blessed him. But when Moses came along and received the law, God decided to give his people a glimpse into how much he desired their generosity. I kind of think of it like a bride and groom who set up a wedding registry at a department store so that those who wish to give them gifts will know what the newlyweds actually want. Likewise, God outlined a very detailed description of his desire for his people's generosity. For the scope of this book, I'll break it down into four simple principles. The first couple of principles for the tithe are both found in the same verse and are foundational. Thus, all the tithe of the land and the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's and it is holy to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. Many other verses contained in the law of Moses repeat these two principles, but here they are in a nutshell. Number one, God wants 10% of all your income to be given to Him. Number two, whatever we give to God becomes holy. It's remarkable to me that the fruit of our labor, typically expressed through currency, becomes immediately holy when it's transferred to the Lord's work. Think about it like this. I could be holding a $100 bill that was once used to buy illegal drugs and then later was used to pay for prostitution. But as soon as I give it to the Lord, that same currency is suddenly sanctified to the work of the king and his kingdom. The third principle is the main directive God gave his people about the use of the tithe. For the tithe of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I say concerning them, you shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. That's Numbers chapter 18, verse 24. Number three, the Levites who ministered to the people of God were to receive the tithe as income and inheritance. The Levites were the ones who had the responsibility of pastoring and shepherding the people of God. God tasked them with watching over the souls of their people and guiding them into wholeness. Our spiritual leaders have the same role in our lives in the New Testament as I pointed out earlier from the book of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. The fourth principle expands on the idea that God wants the tithe to be brought into the storehouse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until it overflows. 
That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Number 4. The storehouse is a reference to the storehouse of wisdom that is supposed to flow from the priests who feed the people spiritual food. The author of the book of Hebrews echoed this kind of language when he exhorted his people, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. The word food in the Hebrew language can be translated freshly torn prey, which is a great metaphor for spiritual revelation. God was basically saying to his people, You are robbing me, and therefore there is no food, spiritual revelation, in my house. This would be true of any of us who withhold the tithe. In other words, when we give natural gifts to God, he gives back spiritual gifts. It is no coincidence, then, that Judas, who literally stole from the offering and practically lived with Jesus, seemed to have no idea that Jesus was the Messiah. There was no spiritual revelation, or freshly torn prey, in his soul because there was no generosity in his heart. On the other hand, Mary poured perfume worth a year's wages over Jesus, and he said she was preparing him for his burial. None of the disciples seemed to understand this, but Mary understood it. She gave extravagantly to God, and he gave her back spiritual revelation. Jesus went on to say that the story of her extravagant generosity would be shared every place the gospel was preached. Jesus taught tithing. Now let's bring the tithe into the New Covenant. The Pharisees, who were notorious for doing things to appear holy, but were really full of evil motives, ran into a buzzsaw with Jesus. He proclaimed, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. That's Luke chapter 11, verse 42. The Pharisees practiced, quote, the cane giving method, which, as we saw earlier, had already been tried and had failed miserably. They gave gifts to God, but they did not love God, nor did they deal honestly with people. Yet even in the midst of their treachery, Jesus told them that they should not neglect tithing, but that they must deal with their motives. Let's bring it all home by answering a few of the tithing questions this chapter raises. To start with, what is the tithe? The word tithe means 10, as in 10% of your income. One of the most important principles of the tithe, however, is that it is not just 10%. It is the first 10%. In other words, God challenges you to pay your tithe before you pay your bills or spend money on anything else. Remember the Old Testament saints who were to give the first fruits of their field? See Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. In this, you are tithing by faith in that you are giving God his share before you deal with your purchases or expenses. Thus, you must trust him to provide the rest of your needs and desires. This is one of the key elements that establishes the tithe as a New Testament principle. You are giving by faith and not by law. The tithe is not a gift either. It is your franchise payment for God's partnership in your life, the most extraordinary franchise opportunity that will ever come your way. In other words, you owe God the tithe. Furthermore, the tithe is to be paid to the storehouse, typically your church, the place that provides for you spiritual meat and milk. You don't get to designate your tithe to a certain activity or person. It is not yours. It is God's. Therefore, you cannot control it. If you ask God to partner with you in life and you don't pay God his 10% dividend, he calls it robbery. You have basically ripped off your business partner and embezzled your stockholder's money. When you give money above the tithe, which is everything above 10%, it is called an offering. Your generosity begins above the tithe. You have the freedom to give an offering to anyone, anywhere you want. God has given you authority over 90% of your income to do with it what you see fit. He wants you to be generous with your money, the 90%, as He is with His portion. God cares what you do. Contrary to popular opinion, God cares what you do with your money. When Jesus went to the church, the temple, he sat next to the offering box so that he could watch what people put in the offering. When a widow put all she had into the offering, although it was just two copper coins, Jesus made a big issue out of it. He called his disciples over and said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow 
put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. That's Mark chapter 12, verse 43. A few years after the resurrection, a community of new believers was so touched by God that its people became ridiculously generous with one another. They began selling their houses and property to meet the needs of the poor among them. They laid their money at the apostles' feet, trusting them to distribute the money as they saw fit. In other words, they were extremely generous, but they also trusted their leader's wisdom to sow their money into the right people more than they trusted themselves. The result was that there was not a needy person among them. That's Acts chapter 4, verse 34. A couple named Ananias and Sapphira got caught up in the peer pressure of their community to give sacrificially, so they sold a piece of property that they owned. They brought a portion of the money from the sale and gave it to the apostles to distribute. But they lied about their gift by representing their offering as an extravagant, we gave it all kind of gift, when in fact it was only a portion of the sales price. Peter, knowing by the Holy Spirit that they were lying their faces off, confronted them individually about their deception. And fortunately, neither one of them came clean, so the Holy Spirit ended their lives immediately, and both of them dropped dead on the spot. See Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Yikes, that will scare the heck out of you. God is watching us, and He cares what we do with our money. Building Monuments in Heaven Now let's fast forward about five years in the book of Acts. I meet a man from Caesarea named Cornelius. The guy is a Roman centurion. Look how the book of Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 describes him. Now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devoted man and one who feared God with his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had came in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him, And being very much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. This encounter resulted in one of the most extraordinary supernatural stories in the entire Bible. The angel tells Cornelius to send some men to the house where the apostle Peter is staying by the sea in a city called Joppa. He tells him to ask Peter to come and share the gospel with his entire family. While Cornelius is having this angelic encounter, about Peter, Peter falls into a trance and has a God encounter about Cornelius. Just as Peter comes out of the trance, the centurion men are at the door asking to talk to him. Ultimately, Peter goes with the men to Cornelius' house, where he finds the centurion's entire family waiting for him. Peter begins unpacking the gospel to them. While he's still preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius' family, and they all get filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, this results in this whole Gentile family getting saved and baptized in water. What a great story. But did you notice how it all began? A Gentile guy, a man who doesn't know God personally, but does fear him, is praying to him, and giving offerings to the Jewish people. Remember that the angel said to Cornelius that his alms, his giving, had created a memorial in heaven? God often commanded his people to set up memorials to him, so that they would remember his works in their lives. For example, when Joshua crossed the Jordan River on dry land, God told him to take rocks from the middle of the river and build a memorial out of them. Joshua told the people, Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask you later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the water of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when we crossed the Jordan, The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Joshua chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. So we are to build memorials to the works of God on earth. Yet what moves me is that God is setting up memorials in heaven to remember our generosity and our prayers. Think about it. Your tithes and offerings are building monuments in heaven and are laying foundations for God to move at the perfect time in your life and in the lives of your family. God cares. God sees. God rewards what you do with your money. Chapter 5 The Legacy of Prosperity On May 12, 1780, John Adams, the second president of the United States of America, wrote a letter to his beloved wife, Abigail, 
that will forever mark him as one of the greatest visionaries of all times. He said, I must study politics and war, that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and architecture, in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. John Adams' understanding of how legacies are supposed to evolve is not just insightful, it is profound. His explanation of the responsibility that each generation has to leave an inheritance to future generations is at the very core of the heart of God himself. The kingdom of God is by its very nature metamorphosizing, expanding, and increasing its influence, power, and glory from generation to generation. In fact, about 2,700 years ago, the great prophet Isaiah spoke of the perpetually expanding nature of God's world. He proclaimed, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. That's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. The words of Jesus echoed this notion when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to be with the Father. That's John chapter 14, verse 12. This Generation The goal of joining the generations is that the next generation would embrace the core values of the previous generations and then build on them. This 21st century generation is the most creative, innovative, and inventive generation ever to have graced this planet. They will cure cancer, eradicate poverty, and create global community that embraces and perpetuates peace, or they will utterly fail. Allow me to expound on my perspectives with a personal story. Christmas has always been the most celebrated holiday in our family. We did not have a lot of money when our kids were growing up, but we always did our best to make sure that each of our children had at least one really great gift under the Christmas tree. Now we have eight grandchildren, and our financial situation has dramatically improved. My writing books and speaking at conferences all over the world has enriched our family substantially so that we can afford pretty much anything our grandchildren desire. This has led to some interesting family dynamics in the last 10 years. Christmas is one of the places where this newfound wealth has manifest the most. Our celebrations have taken on a sort of air of prosperity that at times seems a little overboard and dysfunctional to me. The whole thing came to a climax at Christmas in 2012. That year, each of our children and grandchildren gave Kathy a Christmas wish list, as has been our tradition for more than three decades. But unlike most years, where Kathy would sift through the list and choose a few things for each person, she instead decided to get them everything that was on their list. By the time Christmas Day arrived, the tree had literally disappeared beneath the gifts that were stacked to the ceiling, not to mention another pile of presents nearly as big downstairs. Like always, the night before Christmas, our entire family slept at our house. Morning came early as the grandkids woke everyone with their playful anticipation. Our grandkids were so excited that nobody even had to tell them to brush their teeth. We finally gathered around the Christmas tree and began to tell the baby Jesus story. Each of us took turns at telling the story, with each person's narration building on the next. The narrative concluded and I began to give out the gifts, calling out names as we distributed the packages from person to person in a kind of human chain. Nearly two hours passed as wrapping paper slowly filled every spot on the floor. Suddenly, a whimper to my left broke ranks with the laughter. The room grew strangely quiet. I noticed that my daughter was whispering a strong correction to one of her children. This child got up from the floor, cheeks streaming with tears, and stomped through the wrapping paper, mumbling defiantly all the way to the bedroom. My daughter ordered her young one to stay there until you can change your attitude and the door slammed shut in response. I immediately questioned the child's mother to determine what had caused the outburst and learned that Grandma missed one of the gifts from the child's Christmas list. But we bought the kid 15 presents, I protested. I know, Dad, don't worry about it, my daughter responded. Meanwhile, Kathy retreated to our office and a minute later reemerged with her Christmas list in her hand. I did forget one gift, she said with compassion. I'm sorry, she explained while choking back tears. 
trying to smooth the situation over, she added, I'll go tomorrow and buy the gift I missed. The rest of the family joined in in my protest, reassuring her that the child needed to get over it. I was furious inside, but I kept my mouth shut, not wanting to ruin Christmas for everyone else. However, Christmas was wrecked for me. I could not sleep that night. I just lay there reflecting on my grandchild's attitude and musing over our failure to instill gratitude in them. In our quest to bless our family, we had unknowingly sown seeds of entitlement into the soil of their little hearts for years. I determined to fix the problem. I wanted no part of raising spoiled brats who would grow up to become monetary monsters. Kathy and I decided that Christmas 2013 was going to be quite different. We would atone for the transgressions of the past holidays and begin to instill gratitude into our beautiful, young, ungrateful creatures. Our plan was to buy each of them one great gift. But most importantly, we decided to choose some extremely poor families with children and have our grandchildren buy gifts for them with our money and then deliver them on Christmas Day. The plan worked perfectly. I had our outreach teams pick three of the most destitute families with young children in our city. We found the names and ages of the kids and bought a bunch of gifts for all of them. When Christmas Day finally arrived, we loaded up the gifts and drove through the apartment complex to give the presents to the children. Upon arrival, we worked our way through the trash that covered the front yard, and we went up the stairs that led to the first apartment. The air was filled with the smell of cigarette smoke as we walked single file, navigating several people sitting on the steps and staring at us. All seven of my grandkids we had at the time stood silently at the front door of the first apartment afraid of what might emerge from its entrance. I lined up all the grandkids facing the door, gifts in hand, and knocked. A few seconds passed before the door opened, squeaking in resistance against its rusty hinges. Smoke poured over the threshold as maybe a 41-year-old woman emerged from a dark, smoky room. Her face thin. She was wearing an old pink pajama bathrobe. "'Merry Christmas!' we shouted in unison." Suddenly, eight little kids, ten years and under, rushed the door from inside, fighting for who was going to get there first. Our kids sheepishly handed them their gifts as they excitedly searched for their names on each present. All of us watched with our hearts in our throats as they hurried back into the front room, where the floor was covered in wall-to-wall mattresses. They ripped the wrapping paper off their gifts like wild dogs after a wounded prey laughing and screaming as each present was unveiled. We just stood there speechless, trying to wrap our brains around the intense pain which was somehow intermingled with this peculiar joy our hearts were experiencing. A few more awkward minutes passed before we said our goodbyes and slowly pried ourselves away from the front door. The scene repeated itself two more times that afternoon as we completed our Christmas mission. It's hard to explain my grandchildren's mood, as we got in our cars and headed back to the house to finish our own gift exchange. But it should suffice to say that they never complained about their gifts again. A challenge with John Adams' vision of each generation building on the next generation's accomplishment is that those who make up the current generation often forget the sacrifice it took to give them such an amazing inheritance. They tend not to value it because they didn't work for it, and consequently, They don't do what's necessary to sustain it. In fact, they often don't know what to do to sustain the culture they inherited because they were not there when it was built. An attitude of thanksgiving is the only effective inoculation against entitlement and pride. Yet thanksgiving must be inspired in its recipients proactively by remembering and recounting the perseverance and sacrifices of others. The moment we lose sight of the historic exploits of our forefathers and our foremothers, we begin to digress into the cesspool of privileged thinking, and inheritance becomes entitlement. Instant Gratification Generation One of the worst side effects of entitlement is the instant gratification culture it inspires, the sense that we should get what we want, when we want it, regardless of our circumstances. This instant gratification mentality is expressed in a hundred ways in our society. Credit cards and 30-year mortgages are just a couple of ways that this attitude finds expression. Of course, I'm not saying that these things in themselves are evil or bad. I'm simply pointing out that they are expressions of a culture full of people who want it now, regardless of whether they can afford it or not. Think about it. Credit cards have only been around for about 50 years. 
That means our great-grandparents actually had to have money to buy things. I know it seems ridiculous now, but it's true. One of the challenges of the instant gratification culture is that it can take away the motivation we have to persevere through tough times in order to apprehend our aspirations because we just can charge it. Slowly but surely, perseverance is becoming a lost art, shared by a few and passed on to no one. In a strange way, our supernatural culture can even feed our impatient obsession in that we believe in miracles, which is the immediate intervention of God in a situation. This can undermine our value of life's process that are often rooted in perseverance. The truth is, God often takes a long time to act suddenly. As a matter of fact, many of the most amazing instant miracles I have witnessed have been predicated by years of prayer and persistent faithfulness. This reminds me of the story that Jesus told about the widow who wore out the wicked judge with her persistence. Now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterwards he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet this widow bothers me. I will give her legal protection, otherwise by continually coming she wears me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will God not bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. The reason Jesus told his guys this parable was to keep them from wimping out in prayer by quitting before they got answers. Jesus closes with this profound question about whether or not, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth. The connotation is that persistent, prolonged, unyielding, I refuse to give up prayer, is faith. The point is, if persistence and perseverance are rooted in faith, then the instant gratification, I have to have it now mentality, must be inspired by the wrong kingdom. Furthermore, perseverance is not a gift or even a personality type. It is a choice that we make to refuse to give up when life gets tough. The fruit of perseverance is great character and promise actualized. In fact, perseverance is to our soul what exercise is to our body. When we push against the challenges of life, our inner man gains strength day by day. On the other hand, When we act like impatient, entitled, spoiled victims, our inner man degenerates, leaving our new man withered, weak, and pitiful. Growing Greatness If we are to realize John Adams' dream of perpetually advancing the generations, we must instill nobility into the hearts of the generations that follow us. But many cannot move forward in life because they are fixed on their past failures. They spend all their time regretting their mistakes and punishing themselves instead of receiving the forgiveness of Jesus into their lives. They need to get past their past. We can help them by inspiring them with vision for the future so that they don't look back in shame while they are faithfully plowing their own pastures of prosperity. Jesus said it like this, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 9 verse 62 People who continually look back while tilling their field of dreams will never be fulfilled because they have sacrificed their future on the regrets of their past. When we keep our eyes on the task before us, hope and faith begin to rise in our hearts. It is hope that feels a deep sense of destiny, faith that sees the promises long before they ever are actualized, which ultimately fuels perseverance in our inner man. P.K. Bernard said it best, a man without a vision is a man without a future, and a man without a future will always return to his past. Like Adam and Eve, we have been invited to eat from the tree of life and live forever. Jesus is our tree of life, metaphorically speaking. It is only when we focus intently on the tree of life that we lose our appetite for the instant gratification fruit tree. In other words, it is our big yes in life, the passion we have for righteous dreams that helps us resist the temptation of the world. But metaphorically speaking, if we attempt to sterilize our environment by cutting down the tree of knowledge of good and evil in our garden, 
we actually undermine our opportunities to resist temptation and to grow our character through perseverance. An ancient proverb explains it like this, smooth seas do not produce skillful sailors. To summarize, we want to create a culture where each generation can live in the kingdom that is advancing from glory to greater glory. This is the ultimate desire of the Father Himself. Yet to live successfully in the greater abundance around us, we must increase our capacity for the greater glory within ourselves. Otherwise, like my grandchildren whose hearts began to be infected by the spirit of entitlement, we digress into the cesspool of the spirit of entitlement. It is gratitude and perseverance that inspire hope and faith within us. These attributes and attitudes inoculate us from evil and expand our capacity for greater blessing in our inner man. I want to challenge you, therefore, to resist the temptation to take the easy road. Instead, take the highway of perseverance, which will become the path to your palace. This is the process of nobility that prepares us to embrace our royal identity and fulfill our divine destiny. Chapter 6 Money is not a measurement of spirituality, unless it is. One of the most destructive heresies of the 20th century was what some theologians term the prosperity gospel. This theology was rooted in the idea that spirituality was measured by one's outward display of wealth or riches. Many well-meaning believers swallowed this teaching hook, line, and sinker, which created intense peer pressure to appear prosperous. Fine clothes and fancy cars, expensive homes, and private jets were common manifestations of the prosperity gospel. Yet most of it was a house of cards, financed by massive debt and perpetuated by smoke and mirrors, pride, vanity, arrogance, and egotism. The standing joke was he left for work in a $75,000 Mercedes and came home in a $750,000 bus. In other words, the guy bought an expensive car to impress people and couldn't even make the payments on it. Consequently, he ended up having to take the bus home after they repoed his car. Worse than the paper-thin prosperity was the fact that character often surrendered itself to pleasure and gratification, while sacrifice and perseverance went AWOL. To be fair, not everyone who taught the prosperity gospel embraced clear abuses of Scripture. There were some teachers who took a more balanced approach to wealth. Nevertheless, there was enough abuse that it caused many prominent leaders to brand the teaching as heresy. Life Lessons from Abraham Bill Johnson has said, When we react instead of respond to an abuse, we often create a worse doctrine than the one reacted to. This is true of the prosperity gospel. We have thrown out the proverbial baby with the bathwater and lost some of the most profound realities of the Bible. Let's journey way back into the days of Abraham, whom the scripture calls the father of faith, and see if we can embrace the truth about wealth from our founding father. Abraham did not have a Bible because he lived 400 years before Moses, who penned the first five books of the Torah, the Bible. Abraham did not have a church or even a men's group to go to. There were none to go to in those days. But Abraham did have a unique relationship with God, in which God called him his friend forever. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. One of the benefits of the manifestations of Abraham's relationship with God is that he was very rich in livestock, and in silver and in gold. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2. Abraham was extremely cautious about who got credit for his fortune. When he conquered those warring kings, as we talked about in chapter 4, he rescued Sodom, along with Lot and his family. The king of Sodom was so grateful that he wanted to try and give Abraham all the riches of the city. But Abraham said, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear that you would say, I have made Abram rich. That's Genesis chapter 14, 22 through 23. I'm pointing out here that not only was Abraham rich, but he also attributed his wealth to God alone. In other words, God made Abraham rich, period. Case closed. There's no other way to view his prosperity. In fact, Abraham was not just rich. He had a trophy wife named Sarah. Sarah was so beautiful that even at 90 years old, when she and Abraham journeyed through various countries, the kings would hear about her beauty and try to abduct her so that they could marry her. Oh no, 
This is already starting to sound like the prosperity gospel, but read on because it has a completely different heart. Wealth is a family affair. Abraham and Sarah had a son named Isaac, and although Isaac was never called a friend of God, he also had a thing about wealth. The Bible puts it like this. Now Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich, and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so that the Philistines envied him. Genesis chapter 26, verses 12 through 14. Like his father, Isaac also had a trophy wife. Rebekah was so beautiful that she was abducted by a king. Talk about the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Abraham and his extended family all had the makings of a soap opera, except they all loved God. God prospered them, but the people around them were jealous and consequently hated them for it. Nothing ever changes. Fast forward about another 20 years. Isaac and Rebekah gave birth to their twins, Esau, who was the older by a few minutes, and Jacob. Through an elaborate conspiracy between Rebekah and her son Jacob, the twins' father blessed him instead of Esau, which released some sort of supernatural wealth on the young man. A while later, Jacob fell in love with a woman named Rachel, whom he met at a well. He worked for her father, Levin, for seven years as a dowry. But on the honeymoon night, Levin slipped Leah, Rachel's older sister, into the bridal chamber, and Jacob ended up consummating the marriage with Leah instead of Rachel. Levin credited Jacob's seven years of work to Leah, and he required Jacob to work seven more years to pay off the dowry for Rachel. See Genesis 29, verses 1 through 30. I know, I know, you just can't make up stuff like this. But wait, the story gets even crazier. God was with Jacob, and everything he touched turned to gold. Jacob finally got fed up with Levin's deceit and tried to quit. But Levin knew that Jacob was making him a fortune, so he cut a deal with him that seemed fair on the surface. It turned out, however, to be Levin's demise. The contract called for Jacob to get all the spotted and speckled sheep and goats, and for Levin to own all the solid-colored flock. This is where the story becomes otherworldly. Jacob went down to the watering hole where all the sheep and goats mated. And when the strong sheep and goats were mating, he put spotted and speckled branches in front of them. Consequently, all the strong sheep and goats were born spotted and speckled, while the feeble and the weak of the flock were solid colored, and so they belonged to Levin. Over the next few years, the Lord transferred the wealth of Levin to Jacob until Jacob became extremely rich. See Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 43. After 20 years, Jacob left his father-in-law's place with his two wives and all his flock. On his journey, he had an encounter with an angel at a place called Jabbok, in which the angel changed his name from Jacob, which means deceiver in Hebrew, to Israel, which means a prince with God. See Genesis chapters 32 and 33. Jacob had 12 sons through two wives, Leah and Rachel, and his two concubines. God so blessed Jacob, Israel, that he became a father of a nation. How would you like to become so wealthy, favored, and powerful that you become your own nation? From Family Affair to National Anointing The anointing for wealth that began with Abraham and later passed to Isaac and Jacob became a national anointing that actually rested on the entire nation of Israel. Let's fast forward a few centuries, this time to the days of Moses. God spoke through Moses in the wilderness and said to the people, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who has given you power to make wealth, that He may confirm His covenant, which He swore to your fathers as it is to this day. That's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Wow, there are two things that grab me from this passage. The first is that God gave His people power to make wealth. In other words, wealth is more than financial investments. It is actually a magnetic force a tractor beam, so to speak, that sucks prosperity into its vortex. When God anoints a person, in this case an entire nation, with the power to make wealth, it creates an invisible yet tangible culture in which people feel impassioned to give to those who are anointed, even though they cannot even explain why. This kind of an anointing transcends logic and reason. Its influence often appeals more to the heart, the spirit, than it does to the head. People often feel the overwhelming need 
to give to people with this anointing. We all feel compelled to give to a person in dire need, a homeless person or a hungry child, for example. Situations like this awaken compassion in us to meet pressing needs. There are other times that someone shares a vision so compelling that we are inspired to contribute to see the vision fulfilled. Our contributions in these cases can be traced back to something logical, explainable, and natural. But the power to make wealth cannot be explained by circumstances alone, nor is it just people's response to a highly motivational speaker or even to a great vision. It is instead a spiritual power endowed by our Creator, which requires a divine response from the creation itself to fulfill His divine heavenly decree. Furthermore, the power to make wealth does not just affect the generosity of others, it actually affects creation itself. Think about it. Isaac sowed in the land, and he reaped a hundredfold. The land, creation itself, was compelled by the prosperity tractor beam of God to yield its best to Isaac. What I'm saying is that the elements of nature are somehow required to respond to this supernatural attraction. It gets even better. This power to make wealth also supernaturally affects the man-made financial conditions and situations like the stock market, business deals, and customer sales. Many of the people God has anointed to make wealth do have extraordinary financial minds, but their mere frequency of their success is uncanny and incomprehensible. They often prosper against ridiculous odds. The second part of this verse that I find so compelling is the purpose behind the power to make wealth. God said the purpose is that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as to this day. In this case, wealth was actually a sign of God's blessing on a person's life or on a city or on a nation's life. This is where the prosperity gospel really gets dicey because most of us want to believe that wealth has nothing to do with spirituality. But according to Moses, sometimes prosperity has everything to do with your relationship with God. In fact, some people are wealthy because they know God. I'm sorry, I know how hard this is to hear, especially if you are broke and are a faithful lover of Jesus, but it happens to be 100% true. Before you freak out, let's make sure you understand what I am saying and what I'm not saying. I am not saying that rich people necessarily know God, nor am I proposing that God gives them their wealth. Neither am I suggesting that God does not bless poor people. Yet in the midst of navigating these two extremes, I am pointing out that there is a third option. God does often bless certain people with the power to make wealth. Their wealth is, therefore, a sign of their relationship with God. Inspired by the Rich and Famous The life of King Solomon is the most profound story ever told about God's extraordinary power to make a person rich beyond comprehension. The story began right after King David died and Solomon became king in his place. Solomon went to the worship center at Gibeon where the tent of meeting was pitched and he worshiped God with reckless abandon. The guy literally sacrificed a thousand sheep to God in one day. Aren't you thankful we live in the new covenant which your radical worship is not measured by the number of sheep you offer to God? When Solomon got home that night, God appeared to him and said to him, What do you want from me? Ask for anything. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1-7. through Look at Solomon's request and God's answer. Solomon answered, You were extravagantly generous with David my father, and now you have made me king in his place. Establish, God, the words you spoke to my father, for you have given me a staggering task ruling this mob of people, yet give me wisdom and knowledge as I come and go among this people, for who on his own is capable of leading these your glorious people? God answered Solomon, This is what has come out of your heart. You didn't grasp for money, wealth, fame, and the doom of your enemies. You didn't even ask for long life. You asked for wisdom and knowledge so that you can govern well my people over whom I made you king. Because of this, You will get what you ask for, wisdom and knowledge. And I am presenting you the rest as a bonus, money, wealth, and fame beyond anything the kings before you or after you will ever have. 2 Chronicles 1, verses 8-12. through That's in the Message Bible.
The Bible goes on to say, The king made silver and gold as common as rocks, and cedar as common as fig trees in the lowland hills. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 14-17 through 17. Imagine how wealthy a person would have to be for gold and silver to be as common as rocks. But the real point here is that God made Solomon unfathomably rich. The question that intrigues me the most is, how did God make him rich? Did God supernaturally turn dirt into gold, like Jesus when he turned water into wine? Or did coins suddenly appear in the mouths of fish, as also in the case of the days of Christ? The answer to these questions is unequivocally no. At least four factors mark Solomon's wealth. Supernatural wisdom, favor, excellence, and creativity. All these attributes were on full display when the Queen of Sheba made her famous visit to Solomon's palace. Look at her reaction. When the Queen of Sheba experienced for herself Solomon's wisdom and saw with her own eyes the palace he had built, the meals that were served, the impressive array of court officials and their sharply dressed waiters, the lavished crystal and the elaborate worship, extravagant with whole burnt offerings at the steps leading up to the temple, it took her breath away. She said to the king, It's all true. Your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom that reached all the way into my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. They didn't exaggerate. Such wisdom and elegance, far more than I could ever have imagined. That's 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1-9. through 9. The queen herself was prompted to give gifts to Solomon. She then gave the king four and a half tons of gold, and also sack after sack of spices and expensive gems. There hasn't been a cargo of spices like that since that shipload the Queen of Sheba brought to King Solomon. In fact, whole shiploads of treasures kept coming his way. The ships of Hiram also imported gold of Orphram, along with tremendous loads of fragrance, sandalwood, and expensive gems. The king used the sandalwood for fine cabinetry in the temple of God and the palace complex for the making of harps and for the musical instruments. Nothing like that shipment of sandalwood has ever been seen since. Solomon even received 25 tons of gold in tribute annually, above and beyond the taxes and profit he made on the trade merchants and assorted kings and governors. He crafted 200 shields of hammered gold and had a veneer of gold over a massive ivory throne, and had all his dinnerware made of pure gold. But gold was not his only treasure. He had a fleet of ocean-going ships, and also imported horses and chariots from Egypt, and exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and all the kings of the Armenians. That's 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 14-29, through 29, and 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 14-17. through 17. The Purpose of Prosperity It's impossible to read the Bible with an open mind and miss the fact that it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. That's Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. But some people would argue that this is an Old Testament revelation that does not apply to New Testament believers. Do you really believe that an inferior covenant would provide superior benefits? Really? Well, that might sound spiritual, but it is actually opposed to the scriptures themselves. The writer of the book of Hebrews put it like this, But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. That's Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. God said the new covenant is improved. It is a better covenant, and it provides superior promises. Why not embrace his promises and make the journey from the wilderness, the land of just enough, to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of more than enough. Why not reject poverty thinking, build a franchise with God, and embrace His vision for your fantastic future? Powerful Prayers One evening after midnight in March of 2016, Kathy and I were laying in bed talking about our family. Seventeen years earlier, the Lord had instructed us to quit our ministry and build a legacy. In other words, I needed to stop doing ministry that did not have the generations to come in mind. He reminded me that a good man 
leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. At that time, we did not have much money, but we decided to open a trust account for each of our seven grandchildren, now we have eight, and put in $50 a month in their account. As we lay there talking deep into the night, we recounted our divine mandate to affect the generations that would come after us. We wanted to do our part to build a wealth foundation to launch every member of our family into his or her God-given purpose. So before we dozed off to sleep that night, I said to Kathy, wouldn't it be great if God paid off our house so we could give more to our family? We had already been doubling up on our house payments for a couple years to pay off our house early. So she agreed and we held hands and prayed a simple prayer that God would pay off our house. Six weeks later, Kathy and I were speaking at a conference in Southern California. After my last session, I got down from the stage to minister some people who come to the front for prayer. About 30 people lined up in front of me, and I ministered to each one individually. Nearly an hour passed before I finally looked up and noticed that there was just one guy left in line. I motioned to him to come close and asked him what he needed prayer for. I didn't come for prayer, he answered. I've come to pay off your house. I must have acted a little surprised because he looked at me and continued, You don't think I have the money, do you? I have no idea, I responded, trying to understand his motive. He pulled out a large piece of paper out of his pants and pointed to it. Look, I have purchase agreement for a boat for 600000 that I'm buying this week. See, he insisted, I have the money. I owe a lot of money on my house, I responded in unbelief. You don't owe more than $3 million, do you? Because I have $3 million in the bank, he challenged. No, I owe about 500000 I said sheepishly. Oh, that's a lot less than I thought you owed. So I saved a bunch of money already. Listen, if you want to pay off my house, I need you to go talk to your pastor and tell him what you want to do. If he thinks it's a great idea, then we'll talk about it, I counseled. I already talked to God. He told me to pay off your house. I want to do what he asked of me, he proclaimed. Well, it's my house, and I'm not good with you doing that unless you get some outside input into the word you have from the Lord, I said, fearing I was going to be owned by this guy. I added, furthermore, if you pay off my house, I don't want to be obligated to you for the rest of my life. Chris, I just want to do what God asked me to do, and then I'm going to buy myself a boat. That's my only motive, he assured me. He texted me several more times in the next couple of days, urging me to let him pay off my house. On the fourth day, Kathy and I agreed to give him our bank information. The next day, he paid off our house in full, $466,000. Three days later, he sent me a picture of a beautiful boat. The text read, God said, now that I paid off your house, I can have any boat I want. So I got a much nicer boat than I was going to buy the first time. This amazing guy changed my family's history with his generosity. I like the way he puts it. I slayed your giant for you. Yes, he did, and I'm so thankful for his investment in my family. The gospel doesn't work everywhere? I began teaching on the subject of wealth a year before the generous guy paid off our house. The Lord told me that he wanted to take his people out of poverty and into prosperity. When I started teaching these principles, some people told me that I was preaching a gospel that would not work in Africa or among the poor. The fact is, the gospel works everywhere. It is true that the application looks different in developing nations, but the mindsets are still the same. It's also important to realize that as John Adams so beautifully pointed out, the application of revelation is progressive. We see this in the life of Abraham and Sarah, who left their homeland not knowing where they were going, but knowing where they could not stay. They were literally poor wanderers when they set out on their journey. But as I shared with you earlier, God blessed them and they prospered. Each generation after Abraham grew in wealth and prosperity until Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, actually became a great nation. The progression of wealth continued to grow in the generations that followed, climaxing with King David and King Solomon. Abraham's wealth would not have compared to Solomon's, but then again, wealth is first a condition of the soul, while the manifestation of wealth are relative to one's culture. Simply put, wealth in a village in Kenya is going to look different than wealth in the San Francisco Bay Area. Although the anointing is the same, the application will often look quite different. I have worked among the extremely poor of Africa for 17 years. I am currently part of three orphanages in Mozambique and one in Kenya. We have also planted 12 ministry schools in eight African countries. 
Africa is the richest continent in the world with reference to natural resources and the poorest continent in the world in terms of living conditions. I can tell you firsthand that Africa's main problem is not money, it's mindsets. The people who need this teaching the most are not the middle class Americans or Europeans, they are the poor of the world. We are teaching these principles in our schools in Africa because this is the gospel, and the gospel is relative to everyone, everywhere. How about you, right where you are? I want my life to say to everyone, anything is possible. I want people who visit our house to think, everything is probable. I did not tell you our house story to brag, but to get your hopes up. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. If God did this for us, then he will do it for you. Chapter 7. The Mindsets of the Wealthy Elon Musk sat on the L.A. freeway in bumper-to-bumper traffic, frustrated by the enormous waste of time. As he pondered this situation, he began to envision a maze of Hyperloop tunnels bored at various levels underneath the city of Los Angeles, which would connect people to their ultimate destination. A few years later, through much red tape and near-miraculous interventions, and at the estimated cost of billions of dollars, Musk is now boring his first tunnels under the SpaceX parking lot. If successful, this Hyperloop transportation system will become a true superhighway that literally will put cars on roller skates and thrust them through the Earth's surface at 120 miles per hour. Crazy, you say? This is just one of Musk's more insignificant endeavors. This guy wants to colonize Mars. Yes, the planet of Mars, making humanity a multi-planetary species by the year 2040. Daydreamer, you say? Maybe so, but he has already invented and built the most powerful rocket ever created in the history of the world. And oh, by the way, the rocket is reusable. Elon Musk is rich, but he does not think big because he is rich. He got rich because he thinks big. Musk does not believe in God, but he does believe in doing the impossible. I am baffled by the fact that the greatest thinkers in the world are often godless, humanistic, self-centered, self-absorbed atheists. This is an open indictment against the body of Christ. It troubles me that many people who claim that they are Christians live by limited, powerless, infinite thinking. How is this even possible? How do people who claim to have the creator of the universe living inside of them, the mind of Christ thinking through them, and the Spirit of God influencing the world around them, even have the nerve to think small? I propose that we believers don't have permission to live with limited mindsets. Consider the following distinct advantages of born-again believers. Number one, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Consequently, the God who envisioned everything and spoke the worlds into existence lives inside of us. Maybe we should all wear one of those signs on our chest that reads, God on board, just to remind ourselves of the fantastic cargo that we carry. See 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Number two, we have access to the gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom is one of the nine spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in the book of 1 Corinthians. Think of it as the wisdom of King Solomon on steroids. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Number three, we have the mind of Christ, which means we think like God. This one is otherworldly. We are God's divine think tank. Yet I have heard so many preachers misquote the scripture on the mind of Christ that it drives me nuts. They often take the verses that teach us what we have in Christ and use them to reduce what God had meant to inspire us. Let's examine the verses together. It reads, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of the sage, nor of the rulers of the sage who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they would have understood it, They would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For by this God has revealed them through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except for the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except for the Spirit of God. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he would instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Who can understand what God is thinking about? Remember the Old Testament people were not born again and did not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. They did not therefore have access to God's thoughts. But the Apostle Paul points out in these verses that what was a mystery to the Old Testament people is actually revealed to us because we think like God. Read it for yourself. We have received the Spirit of God who knows the mind of God. Since the Spirit lives in us who lived and lives in Jesus, we actually think like God. Do you want to know what God is thinking? What are you thinking? When you are right with God, you think His thoughts. The Old Testament prophet went on to ask, Who knows the mind of the Lord? In effect, the great apostle Paul replied, We do. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is your X factor, your secret weapon, your brain trust turbocharger. But to activate your heavenly advantage, you must lose the compliant religious rule keeper black and white mindset so you can journey out into the world of mystery, miracles, and divine mayhem. We have become predictable, boring, vanilla, uninspired people. Yet our founder is a radical, forethinking activist who in three short years altered the course of human history. Jesus transformed the way the world viewed God, money, nature, religion, and the kingdom life. Number four, we are a new creation, born again into the kingdom of God. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The word new here means prototype, something never before created. Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet of the entire Old Testament, but he went on to explain that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. See Matthew chapter 11, verses 8 through 11. Consider some of the saints who lived in the Old Testament. Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Esther, Deborah, David, Solomon, and even Daniel. Daniel is a great example of the point I'm making. He was ten times wiser than all the wise men of Babylon. Yet we are greater than Daniel because we are new creatures in Christ. We are the first creatures to live on earth and in heaven simultaneously. Our head is not stuck in the clouds. It is positioned in heavenly places. Some people might think, these guys are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. But the truth is, is that we are so heavenly minded that we are full of earthly goods. Number five, we are endowed with the manifold wisdom of God. By his manifold wisdom, God reveals the mysteries of the kingdom through the church to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. The Greek word translated manifold here means multicolored or multidimensional. Jesus has granted us multidimensional wisdom, the ability to understand challenging situations from every conceivable perspective and from every imaginable realm. See Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Number six, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. This actually gives us another profound advantage. Think of it like this. Jesus told the Apostle Paul, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. In other words, our heavenly seat gives us insight into the future. There are so many ramifications to our raptured status, our position seated with Him in the heavenlies, that it makes my brain explode with possibility. For instance, what would happen if we could peer hundreds of years into the future and see the world the way it will be? Maybe it's easier to illustrate it by thinking of what it would be like if we lived in 1850 and we were invited to come up here for a look at the world in 2017. In this exalted position, we would see televisions and computers and cars and planes, a world much different from our own. 
What an amazing advantage this would give us as business people or inventors. Or how about if, in 1810, we were invited to view the future of medicine? We would see diseases like polio, smallpox, tuberculosis, and leprosy, to name just a few, that plagued our generation being completely eradicated in the future. This is not just a pipe dream or science fiction. This is our reality, our advantage, our rite of passage, our inheritance as sons and daughters of the King. Number seven, friendship with God is a game changer for us. Jesus put it like this, No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. That's John chapter 15, verse 15. When we transition from slavery to friendship with God by keeping His commandments, suddenly we are introduced into a realm of revelation that only Jesus walked in. We have access to all things that were revealed to Jesus. Think of this level of supernatural revelation as Google God. We followers of Jesus have many other profound advantages over those who have yet to experience His transforming power. But it should suffice to say that the most creative, innovative, ingenious, imaginative, inspired, brilliant, resourceful, innovative, advanced ideas should be flowing from sons and daughters of God. When the believers in the first century Corinthian church were struggling with jealousy and strife, the Apostle Paul rebuked them by reminding them that they were behaving like, quote, mere men. See 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. We are not mere humans. We are alive in the Spirit. We are sons and daughters of the God of the universe. He endowed us with wisdom, commissions us with power, and gives us authority to make a profound difference in the world. It's past time that we arise to our high call in Christ Jesus and start thinking like royalty. Stay thirsty, my friend. One of the main reasons believers get relegated to spectators in the game of creativity is that our brain gears get all mucked up with complacency. Complacency is to the mind what cancer is to the body. It seeps into the hearts of people and slowly anesthetizes its victims until it finally chokes the hope out of people. Consider the example of the two greatest retailers of our time, Sears and Montgomery Wards. They were the first department stores in the history of America to market their wares through catalogs. Both corporations strategically placed catalog stores throughout the United States and connected them with huge, centrally located distribution centers that maximized their gigantic inventories. This was very cutting-edge thinking back in the day. Why didn't these great forward-thinking corporations with millions of dollars in inventory and massive purchasing discounts from world suppliers become the first Amazon or eBay? Why did these huge, world-class retail companies ever let Amazon or eBay even get started, much less get a leg up on them? As of this writing, Montgomery Wards is gone and Sears is nearly bankrupt. The simple answer is they stopped dreaming and taking risks. Instead, they settled into the comfortable, slow death zone. The innovation that marked these great companies a century ago was replaced with complacent, lackluster attitudes and lethargic thinking. By the time they woke up, the Amazon monster had clawed its way out of the lagoon and had consumed everything in its path. Religion has a way of feeling complacency in our lives. Religion anesthetizes our brains as it slowly seeps into our souls like a thick black tar gumming up the gears of our imaginations until our innovative thinking finally grinds to a halt. To make matters worse, religious people are often the greatest resistors of new ideas and possibility thinking. When believers finally dare to leave the beaten path of limited thinking, they are often branded as heretics or cult leaders. The fact is, many Christians have more faith in the devil's ability to deceive them than the Holy Spirit's ability to lead them into all truth. We must admit that thinking is risky business. Mindlessness, however, is sure death. A Hopeless Future When the TED Talks moderator asked Elon Musk, why he wanted to colonize Mars. Musk said, I want to get up every morning with hope for the future. To give people a hopeful future, this guy is building rockets to transport humans where they can inhabit a distant planet. In a sense, Musk is preaching our message. We have been commissioned to preach the gospel 
and the gospel means good news. Jesus put it like this, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's John chapter 10, verse 10. Consider this, when the children of Israel were led into captivity for 70 years in Babylon, the great prophet Jeremiah prophesied, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. That's Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Hope for the future is the essential element to accessing unlimited thinking. In other words, in order to tap into eternal thinking, we must believe that there's supposed to be a future. Why would anyone waste time thinking of divine solutions for world problems if there's not supposed to be a future? It is impossible to inspire people to straighten chairs on the deck of a sinking Titanic. It all just seems so futile to them. I talk more about this subject in my book, Heavy Rain, but here's a short excerpt from the chapter entitled, It's a Wonderful World. In 1967, Louis Armstrong, an African-American, basking in the fresh flame of the civil rights movement, stared down the doomsday of his era when he sang the famous song, What a Wonderful World. In the song he sang about trees of green and red roses too, blooming for me and for you. And he thought to himself, what a wonderful world it is. A couple of years ago, I downloaded the song onto my iPad, and I happened to listen to it for the first time during a flight on a way to a conference. The song unearthed a crisis in my soul, one so deep that I was unaware it even existed. As the song played, I found myself in a battle that's impossible to explain accurately with mere words, but I will try here. My heart wrenched with every line of the lyrics as my mind engaged in a heated conflict within itself. My brain became a battlefield and various scriptures emerged as soldiers warring against one another in a kind of noble struggle for truth. I kept pushing the replay on my iPad because I felt as though that Louis's words were reinforcements in my war for reality. As the hours passed, I came to understand that a foreboding spirit foreboding means an impending sense of doom, had somehow lodged itself in my soul and was dictating my worldview. I realized that there was some sort of warped need in me to believe that things were getting worse in the world. I call this the rapture syndrome. Our eschatology has become our kryptonite. Instead of the coming of the Lord bringing us a blessed hope, it has become our woeful future. Allow me to illustrate this with another example from the archives of Heavy Rain. I was born January 31, 1955, the same year Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were born. And Bill Joy, the father of the Internet, was born on November 1954. These men were some of the main catalysts who birthed the information age. Few, if any, of the people who ushered in the information age were followers of Jesus Christ. Steve Jobs was a Buddhist. Bill Gates is an agnostic. Michael Dell is Jewish, and I'm not sure about Bill Joy. Have you ever wondered why there was hardly a single Christian at the forefront of the emerging information age? I believe it's because the Jesus movement, which largely embraced the late great eschatology, was birthed at the same time. Christian young people were all waiting for the great escape, leaving their non-Christian peers to follow the Kairos clock of the information age and become the forerunners of the new epic season. There were no Christian forerunners because there was no Christian forethinkers. We were all taught to live for eternity, but no one seemed to understand that we were also supposed to live from eternity. Flipping the switch. If we're going to embrace the mindset of wealth, where nothing is impossible to those who believe, we must ditch the life of complacency and embrace a hopeful future. Solomon said, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. That's Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. It's not when the thing we hope for gets deferred that makes our heart sick. It's when hope itself gets deferred. In other words, when we stop hoping, I am relegated to the dark night of the soul. Yet from the beginning of time, we were instructed by our Heavenly Father to eat from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. The fruit of the tree of life is the desire fulfilled. It's not a longing delayed. In the 60s, there was a slogan that promoted the use of LSD among young people. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. Most believers did not take acid, but they did tune in to God and drop out of society. The catchphrase of my generation was the last one out, turn off the lights. 
We effectively relegated the world to a darkened understanding and consequently left behind the blind to lead the blind. Now it is time to arise and shine. We are the light of the world, not the light of the church. Like Joseph in the days of Pharaoh, we are commissioned to bring heavenly solutions to earthly situations. And like Joseph, whenever we touch the world, we bring with us the wealth of our Father's kingdom, the abundant life of His divine providence, and His supernatural ability to do the impossible in every situation. Chapter 8 The Outrageously Artistic Nature of God In 1998, we were living in a small yellow cottage with a large covered porch. It was an old place surrounded by a white picket fence. Our bedroom window peered into the flower garden that stretched the length of our home. One Saturday morning in the spring, I woke up at dawn in time to see the sun rise over the eastern sky, reflecting off the billowing clouds in the heavens. The rays of sun painted the sky with breathtaking streaks of various shades of orange and red, which backlit the rolling, curling clouds, causing them to shimmer against the deep blue heavens. This created a canopy of bliss moving slowly in a sort of silent rhythm. The garden's flowers stretched upward into the window, filling the entire frame with a living display of blossoms of purple petals scattered within an endless paradise of countless other blossoms moved softly in the gentle breeze of spring. I stared out the window in what seemed like an eternity in a kind of ecstasy as my soul grappled to comprehend the sheer grandeur of the vast expanse spread out before me. My mind was swirling with awe. Suddenly the voice of God transcended my raptured state. Do you know why I created flowers? he inquired. I was not sure if I should guess until I exhausted my intellect or just posture my soul to receive a massive revelation. I wondered if the Lord was going to unleash for me the mystery of His creation, which He likely had been locked up in the vaults of heaven for the eons of past ages. I recalled his conversation with George Washington Carver when he gave him the astonishing unfolding revelation of the peanut, which became the foundation for several patents. Then I quickly seized on Ezekiel's experience in the Valley of Dry Bones when God asked him a ridiculous question, Can these bones live? The great prophet in a similar situation to mine did not want to sound unbelieving. Yet he also knew that he must not lie to his master. So he blurted out, O oh Lord, you know. That's Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 3. Hastily I decided to plead ignorance and see what transpired. So I sheepishly said, I have no idea. I think they're pretty, he replied. I lay there thinking, and? Seriously, is that it? You think they're pretty? No revelations? No deep insights into the ecosystems of the cosmos? No third heaven revelation like come up here kind of experience? That's it? I lay there for a while longer, hoping my patience would inspire God to go on. But no, nothing else. No voice, no vision, no revelations, no insight. Just, I think they're pretty. Months later, I happened upon a statement that Jesus made, and suddenly a whole new side of the nature of God exploded within me. Jesus said, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil, nor do they spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God, who so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O you men of little faith? That's Luke chapter 12, verses 27 and 28. The lilies do not toil or spin, yet in spite of the fact that they don't work and don't provide a ton of benefit, God still made them beautiful. In other words, God likes cool stuff. God loves art. He values beauty, even if it does not last long or has no other advantage. But now you might be saying, what does this have to do with wealth or anything else for that matter? It has everything to do with wealth. Let me take you on a short historic journey that highlights the incredible revelation of the nature of God. In the absence of the printing press, and with the scarcity of the scriptures, and the illiteracy of the congregation, it was bestowed on the fathers of the early church to create a culture of experience that emulated the nature of God. These church fathers were steeped in the revelation of the splendor, majesty, and glory of the Lord, and they needed a way to communicate in the congregation gatherings the sheer nature of His greatness and divinity. Of course, all this predated videos and movies and the inventions and innovations of the modern world. So from about the third century on, 
the early church began building monasteries and cathedrals that would capture the greatness, splendor, majesty, grandeur, and the glory of God. Subsequently, majestic stone walls were erected, gracing the skies with transcendent beauty. Stained glass windows traversed across the sanctuary, whispering the gospel story in majestic rays of light. Polished marble floors, glistening in the morning sun, reflected the king's magnificence. Podiums elevated to the midheaven facilitated the thunderous voice of the priesthood. And all this was designed as a multidimensional learning experience where the parishioners participated in the discovery of the nature of an outrageously artistic God. But much like the outlandish, expensive perfume Mary poured on the body of Christ and the subsequent tongue lashing she endured from his disciples about how it was a waste and how the perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor, we Protestants have scorned the majestic display of the gospel in the name of stewardship. Unknowingly, we have stripped the good news of its beauty embracing a colorless, drab, monochrome message absent of the majesty and groping for divinity. Gone are the regal church bells ringing from the lovely steeples, echoing the hymns of our Savior, waking the city and beckoning them to gather to Him. The bells have been replaced by video announcements or a PowerPoint display, which pale in sheer grandeur and magnificence. Gone is the splendor of the handcrafted walls and the statues of angels. They have been supplanted by warehouses and storefront structures as if heaven were paved with asphalt streets and entered through metal doors instead of pearly gates. Gone are the citadels with their priceless paintings painstakingly brushed on their skyward ceilings by famous artists. They have been swapped out for drop ceilings and white tiles. Gone are the majestic stained glass windows breathlessly reaching from floor to ceiling filling the onlooker with the awesomeness of the limitless one. In their place stand sheetrock walls, monotonous textures, and drab decor. Lost in the display of splendor is the revelation of the very nature of God, His omnipresence, and His supernatural power. In our zeal to be frugal stewards of finite resources, we have exchanged the nature of a majestic king for that of a suffering servant. Yet the Apostle John reminded us that as he is... So are we in this world. That's 1 John 4, verse 17. John did not say, as he was, but he said, as he is. Although Jesus will forever be the Lamb of God, he is now revealed as the coming King, who sits at the right hand of the Father and rules the world with the rod of iron. In other words, Jesus has elevated with him to the third heaven and has seated us with him on his throne. Our heavenly mandate is to make earth like heaven. Spirit-filled craftsmen. By now you might be thinking that all these stained glass windows and beautiful buildings feel carnal and worldly. Let me challenge the very idea of what is and what is not spiritual by taking you back to the days of Moses. God instructed Moses to build him a tabernacle, and he gave Moses comprehensive instructions for it, right down to the smallest detail. The tabernacle of Moses, as God called it, was to be incredibly beautiful with hand-carved statues and pillars lots of brightly colored materials, and lots of gold, silver, and bronze. In fact, Moses' tabernacle was to be so complex and so ornate that one of Moses' greatest challenges was finding skilled people who could actually build it. After all, the entire Israelite population was made up of former slaves who had little opportunity to engage in creativity. Yet, true to his nature, God had an answer. Look at the exchange God had with Moses about it. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called Bezalel, the son of Ur, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and all kinds of craftsmanship to make artist designs for work in gold and in silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings and the carving of wood that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. That's Exodus chapter 31 verses 1 through 5. Bezalel was the first person ever mentioned in the Bible as being filled with the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus, he was filled with the Spirit, but for a distinct yet different purpose than our Lord. Remember, Isaiah tells us that Jesus was filled with the Spirit specifically to preach the good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, release captive, and free prisoners. That's Isaiah 61, verses 1-4. through But the Spirit filled Bezalel for a completely different reason. 
Bezalel was not releasing captive or freeing prisoners. Instead, the Spirit of God within him gave him the supernatural ability for creativity. God anointed him to cut stones, carve wood, and create beautiful things in gold and silver and bronze. To him, artistry was spiritual. Warning, warning, warning. The Apostle Paul warned us about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Sometimes when we read verses like this, we can walk away feeling as though beautiful things are just evil temptations that godly people should avoid. But the truth is, is that beauty was God's idea. It therefore has to be inherently good because it is a reflection of His impeccable nature and flawless character. Lust is not inherent in the object of its desire. Most often, it is the condition of the heart of the onlookers. The question is not, what do you like? The question is, what do you treasure? When you treasure earthly things and have little or no value for heavenly things, you exchange the blesser for the blessing and relegate your passion to perversion, the wrong version. But appreciating beauty itself is not wrong. It is undeniable that God appreciates beauty. He comments more than 30 times on the beauty of several different women throughout the Bible. He calls Abraham's Sarah beautiful and Isaac's Rebekah stunning. And Jacob fell in love with Rachel, whom the Bible says was beautiful in form and face. That's Genesis chapter 29, verse 17. Esther was gorgeous, and so was Abigail, one of David's many wives. And who can forget the beauty of Bathsheba or Absalom's sister Tamar? God is the ultimate artist, the master painter, and the magnificent sculpture. He loves beauty. He created the concept of splendor, and he lives in glory. The great apostle Paul put it best. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. That's Romans chapter 1, verse 20. In other words, the very nature of God is on display in creation. Creation is God's reality show, his classroom, his university. Yet it seems as though many of us have cut his classes or are absent from his divine lectures. I want to challenge you to slow down and smell the roses, walk among the redwood trees, climb a mountain, or just chillax at the beach while you allow the warm summer sand to seep through your toes. Go ahead and muse on the wealth and other grandeur of God. This is God's world, His heavenly theater. So make sure you don't miss His movie. Part 2. Practical Ways to Grow Your Capacity for Wealth in the second part of this book, I will help you discover some practical ways to increase your personal capacity for wealth. I will also show you some hands-on skills that you can use in your everyday life. I hope these things will help you to prosper both in your ability to lead others and in your aptitude for growing in competence and confidence. Chapter 9 The Tyranny of the Glass Jar in the summer of 1985, Kathy and I opened our first auto parts store in Weaverville, California. With a name like Weaverville, it's probably obvious that it was a small town. At the time, we already owned two auto parts shops and a service station, so it felt like the logical next step in the growth of our business. But more importantly, the Lord actually instructed me to open the auto parts store. We called our store Crossroad Auto Parts. Our motto was, Excellent Service, The Crossroad Difference. Because we were determined to serve the automotive needs in our community in a way that no one had ever experienced before. When we launched our new endeavor, there were already three auto parts stores in our tiny community of approximately 3,000 people. By 1988, two of the other stores had crashed and burned, leaving us just one massive competitor. It was a Napa auto parts store owned by a medium sized corporation, which had about 15 other stores in California. In spite of our tough competitor, we grew rapidly for the first four years, and then our sales began to level off at around 600000 annually. The next two years after that, our sales remained pretty much flat. By year six, I started to wrestle with the lack of growth in our business because I believe that healthy things grow. I asked myself questions that led to a process of discovery. One of the questions that intrigued me the most was, we are an auto parts supplier. So why can I predict within a few hundred dollars, a year before anyone's car breaks down, how many parts we will sell? For example, 
Why is the number of fan belts that we sell next August already predetermined 12 months before anyone needs a fan belt? As I searched for answers, I discovered through inquiry that the Napa store's auto sales were also predictable. Why, I wondered, do the sales of each of our stores feel predetermined? Another question that challenged me was, why did we grow so fast, experiencing double-digit increases every year, and then suddenly stop growing? I soon discovered that the simple answer to these questions was capacity. Webster's defines capacity as the potential or suitability for holding, storing, or accommodating. With this in mind, I envision our auto parts store as a large glass jar, and I pictured our customers as the water being poured into the jar. Of course, the jar offers virtually no restriction or constraint until it reaches full capacity. But once it's full, it cannot contain any more water, no matter how fast or slow I pour. If I introduce pressure and force fresh water into the jar, the stale water will spill out and make room for the fresh water. No matter what I do to modify the water's delivery system, i.e. larger hose or more pressure, the jar's capacity is predetermined and is therefore unaffected by higher volumes of water. In other words, Crossroad Auto Parts was like a glass jar. And there were invisible walls around our store that predetermined our capacity or our ability to take care of our customers. We were also in a glass jar, however, namely a small town, which helped predetermine our capacity. I understand this is Business 101, but somehow I missed this lesson about capacity in our first four years of business. So in response to my simple revelation, I gathered my team of 12 at my house and I set up a large whiteboard. I drew a large jar on a board while our staff patiently looked on. Then I pointed to my picture of the glass jar and said, this is an invisible jar that is called Crossroad Auto Parts. The water in the jar represents our customers and the jar is full. Tell me what the invisible walls are and how we can expand our capacity to serve more customers. Our workers looked at me with a sort of stupid grin as if to say, we have no idea what you are talking about. Okay, I continued. When customers get pressed up against the walls of our glass jar, they usually complain or never come back. So what do our customers consistently complain about? The workers' faces lit up as if they finally got it, and they began talking over one another as they struggled to communicate our customers' complaints to me. One big complaint was, our phones are always busy, and our shop customers can't get through to us. They scream at us all the time about having to call back 10 times before the phone finally rings. Here's the list of the other four complaints our customers had about us. Number one, we don't have enough depth in our fast-moving part numbers. We run out of fast-moving parts every day, and then we have to send our customers to our competitor to get what they need. Number two, we close at 5 o'clock, but the local repair shops don't close until 6 o'clock, so they go to Napa after we close. Number three, we only have two countermen on from noon to 2 o'clock to accommodate everyone's lunch break. These are two of the busiest hours of the day, so people walk out of the store because they get tired of waiting. Number four, Henry's not a very good counterman, so the shop guys hang up and call our competitor whenever he answers the phone. Yes, poor Henry was present to hear all this. These guys could be brutally honest. The next day, I could hardly wait to get started increasing our capacity. Within a week, we tackled the big complaints and installed two more phone lines, designating two of the lines as, quote, wholesale lines. We took our two best countermen and assigned them to the wholesale lines so that our professional mechanics would not have to deal with Henry, our inexperienced counterman. We extended our hours till 6 o'clock, and we also opened two hours earlier. I took a late lunch and manned the wholesale lines from noon to 2 o'clock with one other guy. This gave us better coverage during the busiest times of the day. Finally, we doubled the depth of our inventory on the top 20% of the most popular part numbers. It's always embarrassing to run out of the parts that every customer assumes that you carry. This also improved our reputation, and the outcome was stunning. The next year, our business grew to $750,000. That's a 25% increase in one year. Ideating became an ongoing exercise in our business culture because of the amazing impact it had on the bottom line. Twice a year, we would gather at my house for pizza. Then I would set up a whiteboard and draw a jar, and the passionate dialogue would begin. 
After we did this a few times, our team started taking notes on their insights throughout the year so they can bring them to the discussion. This created a culture of highly productive conversations. The next year, we began giving bonuses to our employees when we used their suggestions, which fueled the fire of innovation and creativity. An interesting thing happened through the evolution of our innovation. Every time we would improve one thing, that very innovation would require us to enhance or improve something else. One simple example I remember was the phone lines that we added to eliminate the constant busy signals. The extra lines had unexpected side effects. Suddenly, there was not enough staff on the counters to answer the phones, so we went from busy signals to customers being on hold. This led to several procedure improvements. For example, when a shop customer called, the counterman would get all the information, the year, make, and model, and parts required, and then call the customer right back when he had a handle on the parts and availability. That way, the mechanics weren't hanging on the phone for 15 unproductive minutes waiting for information. We also added more people on the counter and restructured their duties to put them near the phones during high traffic times. You might be asking yourself why I'm giving you so many details. The reason is I want you to understand that you can almost always grow your capacity in business and in life. If you're involved in an organization that serves people, a business, a family, a church, school, government, etc., then I challenge you to use the whiteboard and jar exercise with yourself and your team. Measuring your personal capacity. Growing an organization's capacity can be exciting, but it is not nearly as fulfilling as increasing your personal capacity. In fact, if you grow your organization's capacity large enough, don't be surprised if you become the limiting factor, the greatest constraint, or the wall of glass that is undermining extraordinary growth in the life of your organization. It is therefore extremely important for you to grow your personal capacity as you grow the capacity of the organizations you lead. Measuring your personal capacity is a little bit more complicated than measuring business capacity because there are no sales reports or profit and loss statements. To make things even more complex, there are also many different personal capacities. Growth in one dimension of your life does not necessarily guarantee growth anywhere else. How can you tell when your personal jar is full? If flat sales are an indication in the business world that a firm is at full capacity, what are the equivalent signs in your personal life? Unfortunately, people often discover that they are at full capacity when they stop being fully functional or when they crash in some area of their lives. They extend themselves beyond their capacity and they suffer the side effects of being overextended. I had this exact experience in 2008 when I ended up on the couch for six months completely unable to function. It all began when one of my close family members had a serious nervous breakdown. This person could not come out of their bedroom for months, which of course had a terrible effect on the rest of their family. In the midst of that horrible situation, my son, who is a pastor on our staff and also has three little children, found out that his marriage was over. As if that were not bad enough, in the same month Bill Johnson was diagnosed with hepatitis A which laid him up for six weeks. Consequently, I was tasked with trying to cover several of his speaking engagements, plus my own, in four different countries. It was the perfect storm. Perfectly bad, that is, for an overly responsible person like me. I knew I was beyond my soul's capacity to cope with this much pain because I started experiencing high levels of anxiety that taxed my mind and body like a plague. I felt trapped by the impossible circumstances that seemed to worsen every day. As days turned into months, on top of my intense anxiety, I began experiencing severe depression that literally paralyzed me for weeks. It took me a year to recover and another year to find a new, healthy rhythm in my life. One of the things I learned from this horrible season is that pain of some sort is often the first indicator that our capacity is overextended. Pain is like the idiot light on the dashboard of your car, which indicates that something is malfunctioning. Let me give you a real-life example. The other day, a young man picked me up from the airport in a foreign country. While we were driving, I noticed a piece of black tape on the instrument panel of his car. So I asked, what's that black tape doing on your dashboard? Oh, he explained, there's a light flashing on my dash, and I can't afford to fix it right now. So I put a piece of tape over it so it doesn't drive me nuts. Drive you nuts? Pretty soon, it's not going to drive you at all, I teased. 
I have to admit in my terrible season that I was just like my foreign friend. The trouble light was flashing on the dashboard of my life, but I just covered it up with hundreds of reasons why I couldn't stop and fix it. Finally, my soul, my mind, and body just shut down completely, leaving me to die on the highway of self-importance. Growing Vines and Pruning Sticks Jesus told us a great but often misunderstood story about a vine and a vine dresser. He said, I'm the true vine, and my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. That's John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Jesus went on to say that we are the branches of the vine, and either we are pruned back or completely cut off. This parable reminds me of my Uncle Sally, who had a small vineyard when I was a teenager. I used to work on his farm once in a while in the summer. This is where I learned about the organic dynamics of grapevines. Left unattended, a vine will spend all of its energy extending its branches until it literally has no energy left to produce leaves, much less fruit. For instance, if you find a branch 20 feet long, the first 5 feet will have grapes on it. The next 3 feet will be only leaves and the last 12 feet of the same branch will be just a long stick. A grapevine simply becomes a stick tree if it gets overextended. If you don't prune the branch all the way back to the area of its fruitfulness, then the vine's capacity to produce fruit will be siphoned off to grow sticks. This is a great example of our own lives. If we overextend ourselves beyond our personal calling and don't prune, quit our activities that are fruitless, we use the capacity we do have on things that don't really matter. Thus, we undermine our divine responsibility and derail our destiny. Increasing your capacity There were three things I learned from my dark night of the soul season. First, there are limits to what I can carry. If I violate those boundaries, I will become useless. Second, I'm not the savior of the world. There is always enough capacity, however, for everything God has called me to accomplish. And third, if I don't assess my capacity and understand my limits, at some point I will probably blow up my life. On the other hand, one of the exciting things I have learned over the years is that you can actually increase your personal capacity in the same way that I demonstrated in my Crossroad Auto Parts example. In fact, it is your ability to grow your capacity that causes you to become a truly wealthy person. I want to share a few ways that you can grow your capacity. These are just an example of some ways you can expand your capacity, although there are hundreds more. The lessons I want to talk about are found in the story in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 28, where Jesus told about a master who called his servants together and gave each one of them a sum of money according to their ability. I will quote the story more fully in the next chapter. But to summarize, the master gave the first servant five talents. A talent was worth about $30,000 in today's funds, so the guy received approximately $150,000. The second servant received three talents, or about $90,000, and the third received one talent, or about $30,000. Again, the amount of money they received was directly related to their ability, or you could say to their capacity to steward wealth. Their master empowered these guys to steward his money while he was on a long journey. Later on, he returned and he asked each of them to give an account for their stewardship. The first servant confidently replied, I'm paraphrasing, Master, I took your $150,000 and I doubled it, making another $150,000. His master was so proud of him. He said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. That's Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. The same thing happened with the second servant. He took his master's $60,000 and increased it to $120,000, doubling his master's investment. The master repeated the same exhortation to him. Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The third servant was a completely different story. The guy was so afraid of failing, he took the master's $30,000 and buried it. This guy certainly was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Listen to his excuse. Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. 
and I was afraid, and I went away, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. That's verses 24 and 25 of Matthew. Before we dialogue about the rest of this guy's stupidity, did you notice that he told his master that he knew that the man expected to receive a return on his investment? That's like getting pulled over for speeding and telling the officer, I knew this speeding was wrong, so I went faster. I mean, the guy was a knucklehead. The master had no patience for his slave's outright rebellion. He replied, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew I reaped where I did not sow, and I gathered where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have put the money in the bank, and when I arrived, I would have received the money back with interest. But wait, it gets worse for this guy. The master commanded, Take away the talent from him and give it to the one who had ten talents. Yet it's the master's final exhortation that completely undoes me. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does not have shall be taken away from him. Here are five things we can learn from this story. Number one, what you have been given monetarily is directly in proportion to your capacity to steward it. Each of the servants was given money equal to his ability. In other words, your personal capacity determines the level of your wealth. There's an old axiom that says, if you took all the money in the world and divided it up equally, five years later, the rich would be rich again, the middle class would return to being middle class, and the poor would become poor again. Of course, we have no way of knowing how accurate this axiom is. But one thing we know for certain is that people who win a million dollars or more in a lottery are usually in worse financial shape five years later. This is a great example of the practical ramifications of the lack of personal capacity in a person's life. Most people who win the lottery become richer on the outside than the capacity for wealth that they carry within. This ultimately creates a lack of sustainability. A similar dynamic is also commonplace when people receive a large inheritance without growing their personal capacity for wealth. Since they did not participate in the process of creating the wealth, they bypass the progression of expanding their personal capacity as they increase their affluence. This usually results in one of two attitudes. Either they have no value for the money because they did not have to endure sacrifices it took to make it, so they waste it on stupid living, or they fear losing the money because they have no idea how it was created, so this typically results in the hoarding complex in which they hide the money somewhere so that nobody in the family can use it and risk losing it. Doesn't this remind you of the guy who had one talent? Number two, if you are faithful, both your investment and your capacity for wealth will grow. Two of the servants were faithful with what they had capacity to handle, and after their financial success, they were given even more. If you are faithful for what you've been given and invest it wisely, not only will your investment grow, but you will also increase your personal capacity for wealth. Number three, risk expands your capacity for wealth. Whatever you don't use, you'll lose. The third servant hid his money out of the fear of failure. His master took the money away from him and gave it to the guy who already had the most money because that man was the wisest and most faithful servant. Whatever you don't use, you will lose. Risk expands our capacity for wealth. Without risk, we atrophy in apathy or we wither in fear. In fact, Jesus called the servants who increased their wealth faithful, and he called the one who refused to take risks lazy and wicked. It is important to understand that it is not financial profit that increases our personal capacity. Instead, it is faithfulness to work hard and invest wisely. We often cannot control the outcome of our labor. Consequently, success in God is measured by faithfulness, hard work, wise stewardship, and perseverance. The Apostle James drives this point home when he warns us about being overconfident in our ability to produce profit. He wrote, Come now, you who say, Today and tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be tomorrow. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live, and we will also do this and that. That's James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. The Lord is ultimately the only one who can control the outcome of our efforts. Taking risks in the Lord 
is therefore actually partnering with God. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about taking dumb risks for the sake of growing our capacity, or for any other reason for that matter. I'm saying that you can only grow in God if you take wise, prayerful risks that put your talents in the fire of faithfulness and hard work. I doubt that most of us would see a person who refuses to invest or steward the resources God has given him or her as wicked, maybe as lazy, but not as wicked. But it is right there in black and white, however. The greatest lover of all time called a hole-digging hoarder wicked. Yikes, that's harsh, you complain. True, but the urgency of Jesus' words awakens us to realize that he gives us good gifts to use for the benefit of others. The hole-digging spirit buries our potential and hides our possibility in counterfeit security and Photoshop reality. It undermines our God-given need in bread in us for adventure and it relegates us to a predictable existence in the land of boring. That land is inhabited by overinsured, riskless souls who long for the government to take care of them. Together they scream, tax the rich suckers, they owe us. We're victims of an unjust system. We should all be equal. Meanwhile, the invisible force of God continues to transfer wealth from the hands of the lazy fearful into the hands of the faithful risk-taking servants. Number four, in the kingdom, faithfulness is a sign of a wealthy soul and it attracts money. Oddly, we also learn that the kingdom actually causes the wealthy to get wealthier and the poor to get poorer. Or maybe a better way to look at it is that faithfulness is a sign of a wealthy soul, which consequently attracts money. This creates a kind of wealth ecosystem that operates something like this. Everyone begins with attracting money according to his or her current ability or capacity. Those who are faithful and wise stewards take risks and invest the money. The Lord honors the faithful risk and causes their money to grow. As the money grows, God blesses the people who are given stewardship of money, and He increases their capacity to handle even more money, and the beat goes on. Number five, people who look like victims or gold diggers are actually living out the financial ramifications of their own actions. Some people who look like victims of an unjust system are actually just casualties of their own inability to live up to their own full capacity and be faithful stewards of what was entrusted to them. Others who seem to have a gold finger are actually just people who took calculated risks that led to incalculable reward. We will explore more ways to increase the capacity for wealth in the remainder of this book. But it should suffice to say here that God has given each of us something to steward, something to invest, or a talent to grow for the sake of the kingdom. It does not matter how little or how much you have, it's what you do with what you have been given that matters. So take some time to press against the glass walls of your capacity, begin to ask God for wisdom and insight into your constraints. Then develop a plan and muster the courage to increase your soul's capacity for more. Chapter 10. A Practical Look at Prosperity Often when believers talk about wealth and prosperity, the conversations tend to focus on the philosophy and or the theology of the subject. This can lead us to believe that financial skills are either unnecessary or at least non-essential in the creation of wealth. I have discovered that although systemic poverty is complex, the lack of skill and understanding about how simple economies function is often one of the root causes of poverty. In this chapter, I have therefore set out to lay a foundation around some simple yet profound truths regarding the creation of wealth. I will also give you some practical skills that will help you grow in prosperity. Let's begin by reviewing the mandate our Lord left with us. Jesus exhorted us to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all I commanded you. That's Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. 500 years earlier, the great prophet Isaiah made a similar declaration, which climaxed in the most amazing outcome in the entire Bible concerning cultural transformation. He said, In the last days, many people will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. That's Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. 
What is amazing about Isaiah's prophecy is the outcome of how the nations come to believers to learn the ways of the Lord. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. That's verse 4. The pressing question, then, is what did Jesus teach us that would be so profoundly powerful that it would cause the nations of the world to never go to war against each other again? I'm sure the answer is much more complex than the scope of this chapter, but I believe that at least part of the answer involves the wisdom of God surrounding our financial dealings on both spiritual and practical levels. And on a practical level, a huge piece of the prosperity puzzle lies in the contrast between the parable of the talents and the parable of the Midas. A Tale of Two Parables Let's step back into the parable of talents told in Matthew chapter 25 one more time and contrast it with the parables of the Midas told in Luke chapter 19 to unearth one of the most divine secrets of a wealth culture for the nations. Here's a hint. Read the two parables slowly, looking for the distinctions between the two. The Parable of the Talents For it, the kingdom of heaven, is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received two talents gained two more. But he who received one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came to his master and said, Master, You entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who had received one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, I have what is yours. But his master answered him and said, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received the money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. That's Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 28. The Parable of the Midas A noble man went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. He called ten of his slaves and gave them ten Midas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you were faithful in a very little thing. You are to have authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him, You will be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina which I kept, and I put it in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, By your own words will I judge you, you worthless slave. Did you not know that I was an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow? Why didn't you put the money in the bank, and having come, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to the bystander, Take the mina away from him, and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away from him. That's Luke chapter 19, verses 12 through 26. 
One of the most amazing insights in the mind of God in the entire Bible lies hidden in these two parables. In fact, one of them contains the only clear strategy about how to make disciples of cities anywhere in the Scripture. Did you catch the distinct contrast that leapt off the page when you compared the parables to one another? Here are three of the contrasts. In the parable of the talents, the slaves received money according to their ability. In the parable of the minas, they all received about $500 each, and all of them received the same amount of money. In the parable of the talents, the faithful slaves said to the master, I have made you more talents. In the parable of the minas, the faithful slaves said to the master, Your mina has made more minas. In the parable of the talents, the faithful slaves were rewarded by being put over many, quote, things. But in the parable of the minas, the faithful slaves were given authority over, quote, cities. The talent parable teaches us that God rewards hard work and faithfulness. But the parable of the minas shows us that the secret of having authority over cities lies in the ability to understand the power of wealth. In other words, when those faithful slaves said, Master, your mina has made more minas, it means that they figured out how money works for you instead of you working for money. The Lord basically said, if you can figure out how to create a healthy ecosystem where money makes money, then you should have authority over cities. The connotation is that God is looking for people who are architects of a wealth culture to lead cities because He wants cities to prosper. We have a river, not a pond within us. This means that the power to make wealth must benefit the world around us and not lie stagnant in our souls. When God restores us, He gives us the mandate to use our restoration to heal cities. This concept is captured in one of the most profound passages in the entire Bible. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all those who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, and the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting, so that they would be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. That's Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. These verses teach us that when God heals us, we have a responsibility to take our personal restoration and extend it to our broken cities. Our personal victory is meant to benefit our communities. With that said, I'd like to present to you a few very practical lessons about the creation of wealth and about money itself to both benefit you personally and to bless your city. The Law of Fulfilled Expectations The secret of McDonald's success is not in their sauce or even in their fries. It's actually in their system. To demonstrate my point, let me ask you a question. Can you make a better hamburger than McDonald's? Most people would answer affirmatively. Why then aren't you a multimillionaire? I'd like to propose to you that people don't generally go to McDonald's for great food. They go there because they get what they expect day in and day out. Let me explain it like this. Let's look at burgers on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the best. If you create an expectation that you're going to deliver a level 10 burger, but you only produce a level 7 burger, you will be in trouble, whereas McDonald's can promise only a level 5 burger, but since they deliver a level 5 burger every day of the year, every hour of the day, in every country around the world, they are going to get the lion's share of the business. Why, you ask? Because business is built on trust, not burgers. Trust means that you create expectations that you fulfill consistently. The fastest way to break trust is to overpromise and underperform. Remember this, your repetition becomes your reputation. Advertising and marketing can get people in the door, but only consistency will keep them coming back. Some businesses are bottom feeders, barely surviving on selfish, self-serving plots. I experienced shopping in one of those businesses recently. It was a jewelry store, 
and over the counter, the store hung a sign that read, All sales are final. No returns accepted. What a stupid way to do business. They're basically letting you know that once they got your money, you are screwed. If your wife does not like the ring you surprised her with from the store, you are stuck with it forever anyway. These businesses are the one-hit wonders based on profit on a single sale. Meeting your expectations is the least of their concerns, but great businesses thrive on fulfilled expectations. The same can be said for your personal life. Many people are extremely gifted and are capable of delivering a level 10 every time they get up to bat, metaphorically speaking, but they are inconsistent, irresponsible, and immature. Because they are so much more capable than the rest of the team members, they are often surprised that nobody wants them on their team. Yet you cannot count on them to perform consistently because of their lack of character. A culture of prosperity is rooted in trust that is built on consistency. Whether you are building a great company or just doing life with your friends, fulfilling the expectations you create is the pathway to a prosperous life. The Law of Favor Jesus said, Make friends for yourself by means of wealth of unrighteousness. So when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. That's Luke chapter 16 verse 9. This is such a radical concept coming from Jesus because he just told us to make friends with money. Now we all know that Jesus is not talking about bribing people or anything sinister like that. He simply is teaching us about the power of generosity. We certainly cannot transform cities if nobody likes us or if we have no favor with influencers. It is also true that there are many ways to gain favor but in a world influenced by mammon, generosity really gets people's attention. I have a crazy personal story that helped drive this point home for me. I have played basketball at the YMCA twice a week for 17 years. I'm not a very good player, but I love the game, and it's great exercise. About eight years ago, the atmosphere in the gym changed from a bunch of guys playing a friendly game of basketball to a competition with NBA-like intensity. My lack of talent made me the target of tons of animosity, as none of the good players wanted me to play there anymore, and they worked hard to make that clear. Soon they were bullying me, making fun of me, and threatening me. This went on for four long years. I would come home so discouraged and often weeping, trying to understand how these young men could be so heartless. Kathy would say, you need to quit going to that gym. Take up golf like most men your age. Those guys are going to hurt you. I had been thrown to the ground twice on purpose that year. I would argue, I love basketball. I hate golf. And not only that, but I love the guys I play with. They just don't like me. Then one day, after an exceptionally hard day at the gym, I was driving home in tears, and the Lord said to me, Why don't you make friends by using unrighteous mammon? What's that? I inquired. Money, he responded. How do I do that? I questioned. Think about it. You'll figure it out, was the divine response. On the drive home, I asked myself who it was that everyone in the gym respected. Immediately, two men came to my mind. They were the best players on the court, and all the men respected them a lot. Coincidentally, both men had obvious financial issues. I had observed them at the front counter on a regular basis trying to negotiate the cost of their membership. That day, I devised my scheme. I set it in motion the following Friday. I paid for both their annual memberships without telling either one of them. I had another rough day at the gym that week. But the following Monday, I walked in the gym and both men greeted me separately and thanked me for paying for their membership. What happened next was epic. When the game was about to begin, the guys started arguing over who got to have me on their team. The rest of the day was like a dream. I suddenly had favor with the two most respected men in the gym and they both made sure that everyone knew it. Many years have passed since that day and one of those two guys has moved away but most everyone still loves me at the gym in spite of my lack of skill, and most don't even know why. The Law of the Neighborhood You have probably heard this law a hundred times, but the ramifications might be deeper than you think. Never buy the best house in the worst neighborhood, because you will relegate the power to influence the value of your investment to your neighbors. There will be no way you can improve the value of your house, because it's already the best house in the neighborhood. The only way your investment is going to grow in value is if the neighborhood improves dramatically or some other outside condition changes. Buying the worst house in a great neighborhood is often the best investment you can make in any city. 
Let's apply this principle to some other areas of our life. Do you want to be the best player on a really bad team? Wouldn't it be better to be the least accomplished player on a really great team? Sometimes, in our need to stand out, we find ourselves making really dumb decisions about life. In our ignorance, we become kings of sandcastles or neighborhood slumlords instead of royal priests and children of God. Remember, your life is one piece of a much bigger ecosystem. Be cognizant of your surroundings and how other people's ecosystems will affect your life. The Cut, Bait, and Run Law There is a tendency for all of us to pour more money into something than it will ever be worth. Often this happens because we invest money in something like a car to fix it, but then the car breaks again, so we pour even more money into it. At some point, the money we spent to fix it already becomes the reason why we're throwing more money at it. Most of the time, we keep investing in something like that so we don't lose the money we already dumped into it. Yet it might just be time to sell the beast for whatever we can get and get out of it. Cut bait and run. I have watched this cycle happen so often in the automotive repair business. People bring their high mileage car in for some major repair like a new engine and I would try to explain to them that with that amount of miles on their vehicle, it really is not wise to pour money into the engine. But they would often do it anyway, and inevitably, a few months later, the transmission would go out. By then, of course, they had so much money invested in the engine that what they had already spent became their rationale for rebuilding the transmission. The Law of Margin Many years ago, I owned a consulting company called Cornerstone Consulting, which was dedicated to helping business people become more profitable, or in some cases, profitable in the first place. It was astonishing to me how many business people actually did not understand the simplest concepts about money. Here's one important lesson that I call the law of margin. Let's say you pay a dollar for a product and you sell it for two dollars. You just made one dollar or 100% markup. Now let's suppose that you want to increase your sales so you give your customer a 25% discount on the price selling the product for a dollar fifty. Your product costs remain the same. Consequently, your profit dropped by 50% to 50 cents rather than a dollar. In effect, you dropped your price 25%, but you reduced your profit by 50%. This means you have to sell twice as many products just to break even. Lowering your prices without reducing your cost of goods is often the fastest way to go out of business. On the other hand, if you raise the original price of your product just 10%, to $2.20. You will make 20 cents more, increasing your profit from $1 to $1.20, which is a 20% increase in profits. It is very important to keep an eye on how your cost of goods sold is related to the price you are charging for your product and how the price you set or the sale you run affects your profit margin. If you want to establish a sense with customers that a product or service is worth a certain price, no matter what your cost of goods are, then you can set the price and give a one-time discount to get it into the market. For instance, if your cost of goods on a product is a dollar and you offer your product or service at five dollars, but then you give a one-time 50% discount, you just told your customer that the value of your product is five dollars even though they are buying it for the hot deal of two dollars and fifty cents initially. This worth is not based on the cost of goods, but on some other criteria. For example, that your product saves the customer an hour a day on some task they perform. You just created another rationale for buying your product or service based on what their time is worth to them. Wealth multiplies when the value of your product is not tied to the cost of goods, but of course, this only works if you have a corner on the market. As an example of working with the law of margin, when I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. At the time, Bethel Church hosted about four conferences a year. One of the things I discovered was that all these conferences lost huge amounts of money. I started inquiring why the people who came to the conferences and benefited from the experience would not pay enough in mission to even cover the cost of the event. Well, one of the staff members said, when we raised the emission price to cover our costs, some people complained. I was surprised by the answer. 
Don't drop the price, I argued. Improve their experience. And remember, if you gave the conference away for free, some people would still complain. The next conference we did, we raised our price to cover our cost and did our best to improve the conference attendees' experience. The truth is, in the past, we had reacted to all the complaints by just lowering the price, so we never put any tools in place to measure the experience of our attendees. This time, we immediately enacted a conference survey to get feedback about their experience. The results were amazing. Our conferences improved dramatically. They were filled to capacity, and of course, a few people still complain. Pricing is an art that needs to be taken seriously. The average business in America lasts fewer than two years. Much of this attrition can be attributed to a lack of understanding of the power of wealth. Many entrepreneurs understand their business, but they don't understand business. I have discovered that even people with MBAs who may understand the complexities of the stock market often don't know the ABCs of the creation of wealth. The Law of Triune Choice We were in the auto parts business in the 1980s and 90s, as I mentioned before, and we grew three stores in 10 years. One of the things I learned in that season was how to choose my business strategy by looking at three basic elements, price, quality, and service. I found that in order to be successful in business, it was necessary to choose any two of these three choices. In other words, I could offer the lowest prices and the best service. But if I also wanted to offer the best quality products, I eventually would not be able to compete. Or I could choose to offer the best service and the best products. But also trying to offer the cheapest price is a slow journey to the business boneyard. And of course, I could choose to be the lowest price and the highest quality products, but not all three at once. Think about it like this. Let's say you and I are competitors who offer basically the same products, and you choose to be the cheapest price and the best service and the highest quality products. If I come along and offer the cheaper price and the best products, but not great service, my cost of doing business is less than yours. My cost of providing the product to the market is less. If you tried to match me, I could drop my price even lower. Soon your business model would become unsustainable. Amazon and eBay are great case studies in the law of the triune choices. They have chosen to offer the cheapest price and the best products and excellent service in a way, but they ditched the brick and mortar store model so as to lower their costs of doing business dramatically. They have redefined what service is in their industry. For example, if I go to Best Buy, someone greets me at the door and helps me to make the right product choice. The sales associate may give me technical advice and even help me with the simple installation, whereas there is no one to talk to at Amazon or eBay. Yet Amazon and eBay have excellent product ratings and a customer advice section, so you can really get a good idea of what level of quality the products are, and you can find important facts about their use. There's also a much larger selection, as long as you don't mind waiting a day or three for your product. As of this writing, companies like Best Buy have gone to guarantee price matching, which means they can be a little higher on some things and then cut the price to match online offers for anyone who cares. Amazon, on their part, has decided to open some brick and mortar stores, which I simply cannot understand. I guess time will tell if the law of triune choices will prevail in the world of technology. The Law of Diminishing Investment Simply stated, the law of diminishing investments means that you can typically fund the highest percentage of your ultimate goal with a relatively small percentage of your investment. It will require a relatively high percentage of your investment, however, to fund the final portion of your ultimate goal. Let me illustrate it like this. Let's say that a 60% investment in your endeavor gets you 90% of your ultimate goal. This means it will cost you another 40% to fulfill the last 10% of your endeavor. If you're making high-end, one-of-a-kind watches for extremely rich people, then the choice is simple to go for 100% quality because your clientele is willing to pay whatever the cost is for the, quote, perfect watch. But most of us are not in the high-end watch business, so you must ask yourself at what point is your investment good enough for the purpose you have in mind? Who is your market and what do they demand? Who is your competition and where do they draw the line? This principle is often at work in our personal lives. For example, is the $28,000 pickup with 90% of everything you want good enough? 
Or is it worth it to pay another 20000 for a truck with all the bells and whistles, the truck of your dreams? The dealer wants to sell you the $48,000 truck with everything you want, plus a bunch of stuff you've never even heard of, because the dealer makes a lot more money on the better equipped vehicles. Dealers often make the sale by convincing you that your dream truck is available for the same monthly payment as your 90% satisfactory truck. Of course, you may lose sight of the fact that you will be making that same payment forever. The Law of Risk Solomon was the wealthiest king ever to live. He had so much gold that silver actually became worthless to him. When a guy like that has advice about investments, it's probably worth paying attention to. So here is Solomon's wisdom on risk investment. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it in many days. Divide your portion to seven, or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full, they may pour out rain upon the earth. And whatever a tree falls to the south or to the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks to the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know the path of the wind or how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1-5. through 5. Here are five takeaways from Solomon's wisdom on investments. Number one, cast your bread on the water, and it will come back to you sometime in the future. Here's the point. Make long-term investments that will pay dividends in the future. Poor people live for today, middle-class people live for their retirement, but wealthy people live for a legacy. Think legacy. Number two, cast your portions to seven or eight because of misfortune. Here's his point. Spread your money out in several different types of investments to protect your assets from calamities That you cannot foresee. Number three, clouds pour rain when they are full. His point an investment will come to maturity in due time, so be patient. Number four, a tree falls to the north or south, wherever it falls, it lies there. His point don't gamble on which way the tree is going to fall, rather, invest in the inevitable. The tree is going to fall. Financing a sure thing is not gambling, whereas waging Your hard-earned money on elements that are unpredictable is probably not prudent. Number five, he who watches the wind and rain will not sow, and he who watches the clouds will not reap. You don't know how bones in a pregnant woman are formed, nor do you understand the activities of God. His point, if you wait for perfect conditions to do business, you will never invest. But if you entrust your investments to God, he will make them flourish in mysterious and sometimes miraculous ways. This chapter obviously is not the final word on creating wealth. Rather, it is meant to get you thinking practically about your own prosperous journey. If you have a lot of business experience, this chapter may have seemed too elementary. But if that's not you, perhaps this is the beginning of a new way of thinking. Wherever you are in life, I want to challenge you to cultivate proactively a plan for your future. You should consider developing at least five streams of income. Kathy and I have 12 so that you are not relying on your job as the only or even primary source of revenue. And finally, invest in your grandchildren's future. In fact, dream of a generation you will never see and sow into their lives. Solomon put it this way, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That's Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. This is the path of the noble, the way of the wealthy. Chapter 11, Mastering Motivation Having a wealth plan in place is important. Investing in the future is a sign of your nobility. But you cannot make the journey alone. You will need a team of people who can help you fulfill your God-given plan. In fact, if your plan does not require others to co-labor with you, then you don't have God's plan for your life. God's plan is always bigger than you. Yet the truth is that getting people on your bus and figuring out how to motivate them toward a noble goal is one of the most exhilarating and frustrating things you can do in life. The Spirit of 76 Our first real attempt at building a team that would actually accomplish something together was in 1980 when Kathy and I purchased our first business. Nestled in the Trinity Alps of Northern California, it was an old Union 76 station with a huge orange 76 ball that glowed at night and turned 360 degrees. 
We called our business Cornerstone Union 76, and we were determined to impact the universe with our world-class service. Our first challenge was finding qualified employees, especially automotive technicians, who had a good attitude and a good work ethic in a town of 3,000 people. This proved to be nearly a miraculous adventure. Then getting them to work together at some level of harmony and at a pace that made business at least marginally profitable required extraordinary miracles. Furthermore, winning enough local customers to keep this team of miracle workers funded in the dead of winter, with three feet of snow on the ground and 28 degrees on the thermometer, well, you get the idea, it was beyond challenging. This was the era of full-service gas stations which require island salesmen, or as we affectionately called them, petroleum transfer engineers, to serve the customers at the pump island. In those days, cars actually broke down. In fact, you had to get your vehicle's engine tuned up every 12,000 miles. Your car required you to add oil to it in between oil changes, and you rarely got any more than 30,000 miles on anything rubber, as in fan belts and radiator hoses. If you tried to beat the system, your car typically came in on a tow truck. So one of the important tasks that an island salesman performed, besides filling up your gas tank, was checking under the hood and checking your tires and washing your windows. Getting gas in those days was kind of an event because you wanted to make sure someone pointed out potential problems with your vehicle before the dreaded tow hook came to drag it into the shop. You typically built trust relationships with your local service station. Furthermore, the service station dealer made only two to five cents a gallon off of gasoline, so it often cost more to sell it than he made on the product. Those smart oil companies convinced us that gasoline was a, quote, lost leader, and that we should make our profit off of repairs and services of the vehicles that came in for fuel. The pump iron salesmen were therefore an integral part of making a service station profitable since it was their job to sell needed parts and services to our customer. Sell, in this case, meant pointing out the vehicle's needs to the customer. Every customer feared the tow hook, so sales were not brain surgery. Unfortunately, this task was often relegated to minimum wage high school kids on the evening shift and young guys clueless about life on the day shift. I mean, the job was not exactly a career opportunity. I know what you're thinking. Chris, why are you recounting the history of the ancient world in a book on wealth? Good question. It's because I'm trying to help you understand the significance of what we accomplish through the Lord's insights against truly incredible odds. I want you to understand with His insights, you, too, can accomplish amazing things against all odds. Island Fever When we took over the service station, my first task was to teach my four young salesmen, who literally had never worked a day in their lives before this job, how to provide great service and sell needed products to my precious customers. I devised a generous commission plan in which they were paid $5 for a tire, $2 for a fan belt, 50 cents per quart of oil, $2 per an air filter, and $5 for every oil change they sold. The first day, I had them all watch me wait on customers myself for eight hours while they asked questions. That day, I sold 12 tires, 15 fan belts, five oil changes, and numerous air filters and quarts of oil. The next day, they waited on the customers while I watched and trained them. By the second week, they had the job down really well, so I let them alone, with me nearby. The first month, these guys sold nothing but a few cans of oil in 30 days. So I repeated the training, complete with a motivational speech. Again, the next month, they sold nothing. One day, it finally became clear to me that this was not a training issue. This was a lack of motivation on their part. I let them have it that day. When I got home that night, I was angry with my young team. I decided to go talk to the Lord about the situation, as Kathy requested. Lord, I moaned, I have this problem. I'm trying to motivate my young team, but nothing I do seems to work. Meet them in the season of life that they are in and motivate them from there, he responded. What season is that? I inquired. Instant gratification, the Lord said. I spent the evening thinking about how to motivate young men who had an instant gratification mindset. Their commission check was being paid to them once a month. So I gathered my team and explained that from now on, we would pay their commission every Friday. They seemed excited at our change in policy, and I anticipated a large increase in sales. Another week passed, and by next Friday, I realized that nothing had changed. My young team had managed to sell 10 quarts of oil and nothing else. 
I was beginning to lose heart. I went back to the Lord and inquired again. He reminded me that he had said instant gratification. The next Monday, I gathered my island salesmen and informed them that I would pay them their commission every day after each of their shifts. They seemed really pleased about the new policy. Of course, the administration of a daily commission was a nightmare. But that week, my grateful band of future salesmen of America sold no product. Not a thing. I wanted to scream. What's wrong with you guys? I scolded. What's it going to take to get you guys to do your jobs? To which they replied, Don't know. Not sure. Sorry, boss. Bad on us, boss man. I went back to the Lord and let him know in no uncertain terms that he was wrong about my band of knuckleheads. I have taken your counsel and listened to your wisdom, but nothing works. I've been your servant, and you haven't. Chris, the Lord interrupted. I said, instant gratification. You, my son, didn't pay attention. Yikes. Monday, I gathered my band of brothers and let them know that when they sold any product, they would put the sales receipt in the drawer and immediately take their commission out of the cash box. They hooted like a bunch of cowboys on a cattle drive. I knew then that I was on to something. The first month, they sold so much product and services that I had to hire two more mechanics just to keep up with the increased demand. Soon we had so much business that our customers' cars lined both sides of the streets for half a mile. Before the year was over, I had to rent the yard across the street from the station to park more cars. By the end of our second year, we opened another shop called Cornerstone Fleet Repair to try to keep up with all the business that my young band of super salesmen sold. The following year, we launched a third shop called Foreign Affairs as our business grew exponentially. My friend and competitor Larry from the Chevron station across the street came over one day and asked if he could talk. Sure, what's up, I replied. What's your secret, man? I mean, how are you attracting all this business in this little town, he begged. I pay my island guy's commission, I revealed. I do too, he shot back in defense. How much do you pay? I showed him how the commission charts work, which he studied like a dog with a new bone. Finally, with a bewildered look on his face, he replied, My commission program is nearly identical. Well, I guess my young men are just more motivated, Larry, I said. I never did tell him my secret formula, but by our fifth year, we were feeding Larry the overflow from our three shops and keeping him pretty busy. More Troubles We grew to employ seven technicians, one serviceman, two parts men, and a service writer. We took care of every single fleet in the entire county, pg e Sierra Pacific, Continental Telephone, Trinity Sheriff, Trinity Probation, High Patrol, U.S. Forest Service, Caltrans, Trinity Ambulance, Topps Market, yet we were losing money like water. In June of 1984, I walked into my accountant's office and sat down. He leaned over his big oak desk and said, Chris, you're bankrupt and you're the only one who doesn't know it. I hired a consultant to help me understand what was wrong. Two months later, he laid out the ugly truth on the shop floor in front of me. In an average 40-hour work week, my technicians charged only 10 hours to the customers. Do the math. If we paid the technicians $15 per hour and our shop rate was $40 per hour, but it took them four man hours to be able to charge one shop hour, then it costs Cornerstone $60 to make $40. In other words, the more work we did, the more money we lost. It was clear what we had to do to save our sinking ship. We had to find a way to motivate our technicians to become more efficient. We devised a plan to bonus them at various levels of efficiency each month. $100 for 50% efficiency, $200 for 60% efficiency, $300 for 70%, $400 for 80%, $500 for 90%, $600 for 100% per their charged hours. In other words, if Johnny worked 100 hours a month and was able to charge 60 hours to the customer, he received a $200 bonus, and so on. After all my hoopla and hype was done, only one of our seven technicians actually improved his productivity. I was pretty frustrated. Then I was driving home one day, and I saw our men playing softball on a team in the summer heat. I thought to myself, why are our men running around the bases for free in a softball game, but they won't rush to finish a break job for money? Suddenly I heard the Lord whisper, when you find the answer to that question, you'll begin to prosper. I pondered that question for days, and then I heard this word from the Lord, the power of competition. Okay, how can we turn our problem into their game, I thought. 
Suddenly I got an idea. I had Kathy take our seven technicians' productivity and build a bar chart for the labor charge versus the hours worked daily and monthly totals. The chart compared each day and month's production efficiency against each technician. Then I took the chart and I posted it on the wall for all the employees to see. I updated the chart every day. When the guys walked in the first morning and saw the chart on the wall, they had very different responses. The technicians who were leading in efficiency predictively had my favorite responses. Hey guys, I'm kicking your butts. To which the others responded with comments of their own. Hey, my productivity is no one else's business. Yeah, I agree. Well, if I got all the gravy jobs like Mike, I would be blowing you guys away. Shut up, man. You're so full of yourself. They argued all day, mostly trying to excuse their poor performances. The guy with the worst stats quit a week after I posted the charts. That is when I knew my plan was working perfectly. Soon, I was hearing a bunch of passionate feedback about our shop equipment, facilities, and tools. The comments went something like this. Boss, if you want me to be more productive, you need to buy another rack. I spent half the day waiting for a rack. The funny thing is, these guys had never complained once in three years about our equipment or tools. Now they were making me lists of stuff they needed every week. I began investing in their lists every day, and their productivity grew by over 300%. Another serious problem soon emerged. Teams, who used to get along so well, became so competitive that they refused to help each other. I thought, Lord, I've created a monster to make money. Then one day the Lord gave me a passage out of Romans where it says that we are individually members of one another. That's Romans 12, verse 5. Somehow I had to figure out how to develop a reward system that inspired competition and camaraderie. I got another idea. I gathered my guys and I added another level of bonus to their commission. This time, I told them that I would give them each a $200 bonus every month that every single technician was above 70% efficiency. But if one person was even 1% below the minimum efficiency required, everyone would lose the bonus. Three of our technicians were commonly under the 70% minimum, primarily because the rest of the team members were so unhelpful and selfish. At first, the response was less than noble as the efficient leaders began threatening the rest of the technicians. Of course, the other techs defended themselves, and the whole thing got pretty ugly. But these guys were buddies who played softball together and hung out as families, so I figured they'd work it out. By the second week, the best technicians were helping the less experienced guys and teaching them faster ways to accomplish their tasks. Soon, the entire team was working together in harmony, and consequently, they earned their team bonus nearly every month. But the most exciting thing to me was that Cornerstone was suddenly born again, our labor sales grew by 300 to 400 percent in just six months. But the best news is that the sales continued to increase every year after that. When you increase revenue without increasing expenses, the result is huge growth in profit. By the sixth year, we launched our first auto parts store called Crossroad Auto Parts. We took the principles we learned from that tiny Union 76 station and used them to grow our parts business into three locations in 10 years. Maybe you just spent the last several minutes reading this chapter and thinking, I'm never going into business. I'm not sure what to do with these business principles. Actually, these are not business principles. These are principles for life that I've demonstrated in a business narrative. This is the same way Jesus demonstrated truth. He told stories about farming, making money, and virgins with lamps, all for a broader audience than the analogy itself. For example, whether or not you're a farmer, you still need to understand the parable of the sower and the seed, or the wheat and the tares, because Jesus did not share these parables to make you a great farmer. He taught them to grow you as a son or a daughter of God. Reward is spiritual. What can we learn from the service base of the Union 76 station? First, we must understand that the kingdom of God is rooted in a culture of reward. The author of the book of Hebrews said it best, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. The Apostle Paul echoed this sentiment when he wrote to the Corinthians, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his labor. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. 
Of course, no commentary on reward would be complete without hearing from Jesus himself, who said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. That's Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Some people think that they are being spiritual by not doing things in order to get stuff. But the truth is that you were created to long for reward. It is in your DNA. It is part of your divine nature. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Jesus died for the sake of reward. How you manage your appetite for reward is vital to who you are becoming. Whether you will be a noble person or a scoundrel is up to you. But denying that you want a reward is not humility, it's stupidity. So get over yourself. Watch your motives and use reward to inspire and provoke you to accomplish great things for the kingdom. Wise Leadership Leading people in accomplishing tasks is an art that is actually rooted in understanding what kinds of rewards motivate people in different seasons of their life. Let me identify three simple seasons that are common to everyone, and then I'll unpack what some people's passions are and align them with their seasons. The most basic motivation in life is survival. I work to feed, clothe, and shelter myself and those within my care. The next essential passion in all of us is the desire for connection. We all want to be known and cared about. And once we are convinced and reassured that someone loves us, preferably several people, then we begin to long for significance. We want to feel as though our life matters. A wise leader discerns the seasons of people's lives and uses the information to inspire and influence his or her team. Let me share a short story with you to demonstrate how this works. A young man named Henry worked for me as a technician at the Union 76 station. Henry had a wife and two young kids and had been out of work for a couple of years. Consequently, he was barely able to feed his family or keep a roof over their heads. So Henry was highly motivated by money. He worked all the overtime he could get. He also performed well for raises and bonuses. So anytime I needed Henry to learn a new skill or to master a different type of car, I just offered to give him a bonus when he was proficient at the goal. Things were great between us and Henry became our very best technician because he was so hungry. But about the fifth year of Henry's employment, something dramatically shifted in him that took me over a year to figure out. He stopped wanting to work overtime and he often refused to learn a new skill and money ceased to motivate him. I tried everything I could think of to inspire him, including raises and bonuses, but nothing worked. Finally, I came to realize something. When people achieve the ability to live at the economic level outside of themselves, that they are living inside of themselves, they have just exited the land of mere existence. In other words, everyone has a dream of what the perfect life looks like in his or her heart. For example, maybe it is that I have a little house on a hill with a white picket fence around it. When they obtain the financial ability to apprehend that house, money is no longer a motivator in their lives. It will take a new strategy to inspire these people. It is important to understand that the need for approval and the need for a significance are not the same thing. The need for approval makes a person want to fit in and it is driven by the desire to feel connected. This drive for approval is part of the connection season. But the need for significance makes people want to stand out. Significance and connection are two different epic seasons in life that sometimes collide simultaneously in the soul of a man. Henry was in a crisis of his soul, stuck between significance, wanting to stand out, and connection, needing approval. But something powerful was about to change. Our entire team respected Henry, so he sort of journeyed through the land of connection at the same time he was leaving the land of survival. But the day we posted the efficiency charts on the wall, a brand new era was born in Henry's life. Henry's need for significance was suddenly met when he was recognized as the most productive employee, the star of the Cornerstone team. It touched something so deep in his soul that he began to work the way Michael Jordan played basketball in championship games. The man was a house on fire. Not only was he making me tons of money, he was happy again, alive, funny, and inspiring. Although the rest of the team was in survival or connection mode at the time, they fed off of Henry's enthusiasm, which caused our shop to become electric with passion. Sometimes entire organizations have a Henry moment. As the members of a team simultaneously awaken to a level of significance previously unattainable to them, this dynamic often occurs when fame and or fortune are introduced abruptly into a culture. 
leading people who are in survival or connection mode and who are watching someone else on the team suddenly move into a place of significance, fame, or fortune can be heart-wrenching. The way we manage this cultural transition determines whether or not these opportunities become constructive or destructive. Soul Power One of the ramifications of not understanding the dynamics of the soul is that you tend to rule your environment with fear, shame, or manipulation. These tools may provide you with short-term wins, but they have long-term negative side effects. Living in an environment that is inwardly hostile towards you for punishing your team into performing is not just unwise, it is dumb. Don't be a lazy leader. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. See Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Use tools that have positive effects. Let me expand on our motivational tools. Number one, you always get what you reward. First decide what it is that you want your team to actually accomplish. Next, figure out what the reward looks like and how the reward is going to be tied directly to the goal. Giving a team member a bonus that is not tied to performance goals might help the person be loyal, but probably not productive. Providing the reward even though the team member falls short of the goal undermines the purpose of goal setting. If you set goals so high that nobody can obtain them without a miracle, you defeat the reason for goal setting, which is creating urgency. Number two, the reward must be viable to be valuable. Let me explain it with a more modified example of my story above. Let's say instead of rewarding the technicians with $200 for 60% efficiency, you reward them with $10,000. You just created an unsustainable reward system because the reward is more money than the business you earn through the extra production. Now let's view it a different way. What would happen if you gave them $2 for 60% efficiency? Probably not much. The reward is not congruent with the task. Number three, the reward system must be progressively constant to be properly motivating. For example, if you pay $500 for 60% efficiency, but you only pay $100 for 80% efficiency, your system actually rewards you for doing less and less for doing more. Although this example makes the principle obvious, leaders ignorantly do this very thing all the time in less apparent ways. Number four, if you fail to deliver the reward you promised in a timely manner, then you might as well throw out the entire system. It is better not to promise something than to promise and not perform. Number five, changing the goal or reward in the middle of the season, or worse yet, in the middle of the month, is devastating, dishonest, and unfair. The reward system should have a clearly communicated duration, including start and finish dates. Number six, the reward system must address the side effects of the reward itself. For example, if the techs are working faster to get the reward, but their work gets sloppy and results in more warranty claims, then the reward system must also become the deterrent. For example, in our system, if a car came back for a warranty on the work Henry did, and it was his fault, Henry lost the commission he received for that job, and he also lost the same amount of money against his current commission. Number seven, if the reward system does not take into account the season people are in, like my high school guys in instant gratification mode, or Henry's need for significance, not money, then the system will not work. Number eight, if the reward system fixes one problem, for instance productivity, but breaks something else, like morale, then just adjust the system to enhance them both. Number nine, lots of things are more motivating than money, especially outside the business world, so if money is tight or unavailable, then be creative about the way you reward people. Recognition is a great way to motivate people. Things like employee or teammate of the month are beautiful ways to inspire them. A reserved parking space displaying a note of recognition for a person's outstanding service is another way to inspire people. And an email blast about the accomplishment of a team member is also a great morale builder. Reward versus Recognition I think this is a good time to clarify how different kinds of reward systems give rise to various types of outcomes. There is a big difference between a reward and recognition. A reward must have performance goals attached to it, but recognition is acknowledging a person's contribution to the organization. You will not motivate people to be more efficient by giving them random bonuses for being great employees. Bonus systems that are not tied to agreed upon, clearly communicated, targeted criteria 
will not consistently lead to productivity. Random bonuses say thank you, and done right, they can really boost morale, which does enhance performance indirectly. But be careful, recognizing an employee who obviously is performing poorly will send the wrong message to the rest of the team and will probably backfire on you. In life and at work, you will always have certain people you enjoy and like more than others. And you will sometimes have teammates you actually don't like or at least don't enjoy. That is your prerogative as a person. But as a leader, your reward and bonus systems have to be just, not twisted to reward your friends or to punish those who don't have favor with you. In your personal life, you can give your friends gifts after hours all you want. But treating people in an organization or a workplace with favoritism, without performance qualifiers that others around them can also attain, will undermine your entire wealth culture. The Art of Goal Setting The purpose of a reward system is threefold. Number one, create urgency in a culture and funnel it towards performance goals. Number two, improve productivity by focusing effort and energy on recognized objectives. Number three, create an atmosphere of fun through competition. Let me give you an analogy to help you with the art of goal setting. Let's say you're supposed to catch a bus at 3 o'clock p.m. and you arrive 60 seconds late. As you walk up to the bus, the door closes and it starts to roll away. Are you going to run after that bus and try to get the driver to open the door? Most likely. Now let's change the scenario. This time you arrive five minutes late and the bus is three blocks down the road. Are you going to chase that bus? No way. There's no chance you will ever catch that bus, barring a miracle. Think of goal setting in terms of my bus analogy. You want a culture to have a sense of urgency. Urgency is your secret invisible master manager. You don't pay him, he never takes a vacation, and he's great to have in the lunchroom. But most importantly, he is managing the productivity of your team while you are away. That's great. How do I hire Mr. Urgency, you inquire? Good question. He only works for people who understand the art of goal setting. If you give someone 40 hours to do a 20-hour job, what hour will they finish it? Yep, you guessed it, in the 40th hour. If you give someone a 20-hour job and give them 10 hours to finish it, will they rush to get it done? No, because like the bus that is three blocks down the road when you arrive, there is no chance of catching that bus. There is no chance you will finish a 20-hour task in 10 hours. How about if you give 19 hours to complete a 20-hour task? Will you finish it then? Yes. This is like the bus that rolls away as you get to the bus stop. You will chase it. That is the world that Mr. Urgency works in, the world of realistic but ambitious goals. To create a culture that employs Mr. Urgency, it's paramount that these three principles are present. Number one, well-defined goals that everyone understands. Number two, timelines that are well thought out and lean towards just enough time to accomplish the task agreed upon. Number three, a feedback system in which everyone in the environment always knows the score, metaphorically speaking. In other words, there is a way for people who have been tasked with a certain duty to know where the task falls in the time continuum of the ultimate goal. If we are painting the office by Friday, the task itself is a feedback system. Everybody can look at the wall and see what's been accomplished so far, and of course, they know what day it is. But many tasks will need a more complex scoring system since it's not easy to know if the task is on schedule. You cannot expect people to hit targets if the reporting is slow, inaccurate, or not available for everyone to view. World Changers Like the stewards in the parable of the talents and the minas, the goal is to create wealth cultures in which money makes money. If you could learn to create ecosystems of wealth, we could help people succeed in life without needing government subsidies. Learning how to motivate people is one of the secrets of a wealth culture. I want to inspire you to become more than a hardworking, faithful servant. Instead, become a world changer by inspiring people to follow you and doing something truly great for the kingdom. Chapter 12. The Company You Keep Someone once said, Show me a man's friends, and I will tell you about the man's character. We should love everyone and never neglect the poor or the needy, but the people whom we allow to influence us determine our future. Everywhere I go, people seem obsessed with finding their destiny. The million-dollar question appears to be, why am I alive, and what was I born to do? 
I have taught people for years that the next thing to finding God, the most important thing they can do in life, is to find their purpose. But I was wrong. The truth is you cannot find your purpose until you have found your people, because your ultimate purpose is in your people. People ask me all the time if I had a vision when I was a boy for the ministry that I'm in. No, my vision grew out of the role I play with the people I'm called to be in community with. We are all part of the body of Christ. If I'm a finger, I need to connect with a hand. If I'm an eye, I need to find my place in the head, and so forth. I simply cannot find my ultimate destiny without finding my God-given place in the body. If you'd like to know more about how to and where to find your people, read my book Destined to Win, in which I dedicated two chapters to the subject. With that being said, we should prayerfully and proactively choose whom we allow to influence us. When Moses came down from the mountain, he was glowing like a light bulb. He had to put a veil over his face for the sake of the people. That veil filtered the way people perceived him and the way Moses saw the world. Our friends inspire so much of the way we view and translate the world around us. Solomon said it like this, Leave the presence of a fool, or you will not discern the words of knowledge. That's Proverbs chapter 14, verse 7. He also said, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. That's Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. And the great apostle Paul always blows me away with his insights. The guy is so blunt. He writes, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. My point is that the company you keep matters a lot, a whole lot. Many people have friendships that are an inch deep and a mile wide. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says, A man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I'm talking about real friends who stick closer than a brother, people you do life with, whom you respect and whom respect you. They will mold your soul and anchor your core values into their accent, the way they see things for life. One of the dynamics I have observed on our Bethel church teams is that often they are negatively impacted by the mindsets of the broken people they set out to help. A conversation I had a while back at lunch with a few of our outreach pastors characterizes this perfectly. These pastors' primary ministry is to the homeless and extremely poor. One of them began to recount to me how sad it is that the middle-class people of our city don't want the homeless and poor in their neighborhoods and in front of their businesses. They aren't compassionate people who understand the plight of these broken people, this pastor scolded. The others chimed in with their amens. I was noticeably silent until they finished their comments. Then I said, guys, the homeless live a life of selfishness and destruction. They don't work, and they don't make positive contributions to our society. They steal from our business people. They beg in front of their businesses, driving their hard-earned customers away. Many of them throw their garbage all over our streets, and they make a huge mess in our beautiful riverbanks. That's why the middle-class people don't want them around. And by the way, the need for understanding should flow both ways. Being poor doesn't give you the right to be insensitive to the needs of others around you, including the business people you hurt. The pastors looked at me as if I was speaking Martian or something. I went on to tell them, you'll never give anyone a hand up by getting down in the mental mud with those who have a victim mentality. Chucking stones at the provision palace will not help you lift the poor out of poverty. It will, however, succeed in building an us-than-them mentality. Personally, I've worked with the poor for four decades, and I'm on a team commissioned to help solve the homeless issue in our community. I am therefore aware that many of our homeless and extremely poor friends are mentally ill and or really hurting. They need much more compassion than I expressed to my team above. But again, my point is that we cannot become like the people we help in order to understand their plight and see them truly freed from their bondage. My Best Friend The ultimate way to transform your thinking to a wealth mentality is to hang around people who think from a wealth perspective. There's no better place to start than with God himself, but I'm afraid that we are becoming overly familiar with the God we barely know. Knowing God from a distance or studying him as you would the life of Winston Churchill or dissecting him like a frog is nothing like having a real friendship with him. In the book of John, Jesus taught us that God wants to prune us the way a vine dresser prunes a grapevine back to the place of its fruitfulness. He went on to explain to us that we are pruned by allowing Jesus to speak correction to us and by embracing his discipline from the heart, which is how we are being pruned with a promise. 
See John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Pruning begins the process of abiding in Christ, which in turn causes us to be friends with God, friends who are allowed to benefit from our relationship with Him. In fact, Jesus said, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. That's John chapter 15, verse 7. In other words, if you let Jesus influence your heart, attitude, and actions, He will let you influence Him, and He will give you anything you wish. Now that will destroy the poverty mentality in you. This promise is so powerful. But as I said in chapter 2, it does not mean that based on selfish motives, we can name and claim anything we want. Let's not miss the fact that this privilege is only for those who meet the abiding requirements that we just talked about. Then Jesus went on to say, No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things I've heard from the Father I've made known to you. That's John chapter 15, verse 15. This is the ultimate climax of human interaction with God, a person bonding so closely with his or her creator that they become intimate friends in a relationship in which they share their closest secrets. The transition from slavery to friendship with God introduces us into the realm of revelation that only Jesus walked in, as I mentioned in chapter 7. I think of this level of supernatural revelation as Google God, except from the heart, not from the head. What better way is there to move out of a poverty mindset into a wealth mentality than to grow from a master-slave relationship into a friendship with God who knows no impossibilities? There is a startling fact here, held just below the surface of the waters of Revelation, about the root cause of poverty. A slave does not know what his or her master is doing. So poverty is not the lack of money, it's the lack of revelation. The Old Testament story of Joseph gives us a great example of how withholding information enslaves people. Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams as being about seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Then Joseph wisely instructed Pharaoh to store 20% of all the grain in Egypt during the seven years of abundance so that there would be enough food to feed the nation during the famine. See Genesis chapter 41. But Joseph withheld the revelation about the coming famine and the plan to store food from the Egyptian population. The result was that all the Egyptian inhabitants became slaves as they sold themselves to Pharaoh for food. Here is the account. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us in our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that our land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land for Pharaoh, and every Egyptian sold his field, because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. That's Genesis chapter 47, verses 19 through 20. If Joseph simply had shared with the Egyptian people the same revelation he had gave Pharaoh, the Egyptians would have become the richest people on the planet, because the famine affected the entire known world, and people were coming from every nation to purchase food. Instead, Joseph's secret, the information he withheld, created a two-class system, rich and poor, and a first-world nation to become a third-world nation in one generation. The next Pharaoh, who rose to power, enslaved the Israelites, see Exodus chapter 1. Joseph enslaved the Egyptians, and the next generation of Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. In other words, what you sow, you will reap. Now think about Africa, which is the poorest continent in the world by nearly every economic indicator, yet the richest continent in the world in natural resources. This fact alone makes it clear that Africa's problem is not money. I would like to propose that the poverty there is driven by a lack of revelation and understanding. Furthermore, if Joseph could turn a first world country into a third world country simply by withholding revelation about Pharaoh's dream, then it stands to reason that such a process could be reversed. Africa could transition from a third world country to a first world country simply by changing its status with God from slavery to friendship. In fact, the dream is already alive as many African believers who have become friends with God are changing the continent of Africa with their revelations and insight. It is just a matter of time before Africa will be one of the wealthiest continents in the world. Changing Friends In the last few years, I have found great favor with a few wealthy people and have discovered that possibility thinking, the idea that everything is possible, is very inspiring. 
The mindset of these people awakened something so deeply asleep in me that I did not even know that it was inside of me. Just being in the room with them while dialoguing about the challenges of our city is exciting and stimulating. They take everyone in the room to a new level of thinking. My friend Michael Clifford is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. He created two startup companies in a garage that were taken public and made billions of dollars. For instance, he bought a nearly bankrupt school called Grand Canyon University that was $40 million in debt and was losing $16 million per year. Then he assembled a team of leaders who transformed it into a world-class university, making $400 million per year. The team he recruited took the university public with an IPO, which at the time of this writing was valued at $4 billion. This was not a lucky fluke. This is a way of life for Michael and his business partners. This is what he does. He does it day in and day out, all the time. Michael creates, as he's done with Jack Wells, Forbes, and now Apple founder Steve Wozniak. He always swings for the fences. He says that he's had more failures than successes, but it is in failure that experience creates successes. I've had a relationship with Michael for about five years, and it has grown deeper every year. It all began when Michael read my book, Spirit Wars, and it brought him out of the darkest time in his life. A few months ago, I decided to expose my Bethel leadership team to him. These are men and women of God who believe in miracles and have done some really amazing things with his help. In a city of 89,000 people, they have built the largest Sivas approved vocational school in America with 2,400 full-time students, including 953 international students from 65 nations, along with nationals from 47 states. They have also built a record label that five years ago did 300000 in revenue, and then they grew it to $11.3 million in business last year, not to mention that its artists won six Dove Awards along the way. This is the same team who built the church of 9,000 people in weekend attendance, which is 10% of our city's population. I tell you all this just to let you know that these folks are not wimps. When the meeting with them began and the niceties were complete, I asked Michael to speak. Michael is not a motivational speaker or anything like that. He's a behind-the-scenes leader. But suddenly, you could hear a pen drop. My team just sat there in some sort of shock, listening to someone who thinks much bigger than they do. It took several minutes after Michael had finished for anyone to even make a comment or ask a question. Then something happened. Several of them began to catch the wind of Revelation. Drafting off of Michael, they started ideating on a whole new level. It was beautiful listening to our team imagine together a world the way God intended, a world of possibility, faith, and extraordinary miracles. A month ago, Michael and a few of my team members were interacting over the poverty issue in our community. Reading has one of the worst economies in the nation for a city our size. Michael began talking about shifting the economy by transforming the financial ecosystems of our city. His ability to see the big picture and understand how things like education are catalytic to our economy is astounding. In the meeting, he began mapping out a plan that would inspire a prosperous city. Soon, everyone was chiming in with equally powerful ideas. I left the meeting thinking, if I could transport all the people I've been assigned to influence into that two-hour meeting, I wouldn't have to write this book. It was that mind-altering. Relegated to small thinking. I have laid in bed at night wondering why people like Michael don't have a ton of influence in our cities. Why aren't these people invited to lead our communities out of poverty and into prosperity? I don't really get it. I began engaging my social network audience a few months ago to try to understand the broader perspective of why such people are not invited into leadership of the nations. I do understand that some wealth-minded people find their way to the top of the leadership pile in a relatively few nations, but not to the level that seems reasonable. I started by posting a few short comments on my Facebook page about the benefits of the way the wealthy think. Oh man, I unleashed a firestorm of criticism that made it feel as if something had crawled out of hell and slithered its way onto the pages of my network wall. Worse yet, about 70% of the people who follow me on Facebook describe themselves as Christians. Here's a sample of a few of their comments. Rich people make me sick. They oppress the poor, steal money from the masses while they live in their glass mansions. I say screw the rich. They're destroying our country. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Jesus warned us about those wealthy pigs. I got nearly 450 comments on my first post, many of which were nothing less than vile. 
I was floored. Okay, now I understand why people with wealth are often isolated to ice castles of our communities. I discovered a wealth-phobic snake pit that would rival the prejudice of any ethnic or religious group in the world. Let me address a few of these negative ideologies with some thoughts of my own. First off, the idea that wealthy people are inherently selfish or that by the nature of their prosperity they oppress the poor is a lie. Yes, many rich people oppress the poor, but many more wealthy citizens take care of the poor, create jobs, spend billions of dollars every year funding various projects that improve the lives of those around him. Some of the most obvious examples are Bill and Melinda Gates, who are two of the wealthiest people alive today. They are investing billions of dollars in Africa to shift the poverty mindset of that continent. You may not like their approach to the problem, but it's their money and they should be able to spend it the way they want. Ray and Joan Croft, the founders of McDonald's, not only put tens of thousands of people to work in entry-level jobs, they also left most of their fortune to the Salvation Army. Joan was actually the visionary giver of the family, and she is the one who gave most of their wealth away. The list goes on and on. People with names like Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Warren Buffett, and Paul Allen, just to name a few, not only collectively provided jobs for millions of people, but also spent or spend billions of dollars to take care of others. My guess is that there are many more generous billionaires than there are selfish ones. Part of the challenge is that most wealthy people give in secret, or else they would have endless line of leeches sucking the life out of their souls. But giving in secret is only popular in heaven. On earth, if you are wealthy, you must publicize your endeavors or risk being lynched by the entitled. In fact, if you have a nice car and or a house, many people will judge you as selfish without so much as a conversation about your generosity. The people who post horrible things about the wealthy are often the same people who don't think twice about praying for God to pay off their bills, get them a job that pays more money, or help them buy a house. These can be great prayers, but the people who pray them can set such a double standard that it makes me crazy. I grew up among the poor, and I can tell you that there are many times more selfish people among the poor than there are among the rich. The truth is, many people became wealthy because they were generous, and many others stay poor because they are not. Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running not all over. That's Luke chapter 6, verse 38. But if you are generous, and Jesus gives you so much that it is running out all over, you'd better hide it, or you'll be branded a prosperity teacher or relegated to the halls of heresy. Be the best in the world. No matter what you do in life, people will judge your motives, methods, and means. It's inevitable. There's an old adage that says, if you're successful, you'll win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. People who make the greatest impact in life are typically criticized in their lifetime and enshrined in glory after they are dead. What I'm saying is this, if you want to make history, you will have to step out of the crowd of comfort, convenience, and cowardice and press into God's wealth mentality. Cultivating the mind of Christ will put you in an elite class of people, not because you're better than anyone else, but because you dared to leave the shore of small, fearful thinking to venture out into the sea of possibility. Thomas Aquinas put it like this, If the highest aim of the captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in port forever. Kingdom wealth always requires risks. It's important to remember the lessons about poverty, riches, and kingdom wealth that you have learned on our journey together so that you can embrace your God-given identity and fulfill your divine purpose. You will recall that the greatest effect of true kingdom wealth is the positive influence it has on others. That being said, I want to challenge you to join me on this journey to make an impact on the world for good by the God who knows no impossibilities. The voyage will be exciting and even treacherous at times, but the sacrifice that greatness will require cannot be compared to the glory of the exploits we will do as we carry out heaven's mission. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. So be it. Thank you for listening to this recording on Poverty, Riches, and Wealth, written and read by Chris Valentin. This audio recording was produced in 2018 by Christian Audio.